Hey, hello everybody, the drinker is here, and uh, yeah, sorry I'm late and gay as always with these things, I just get caught up in other stuff, mostly drinking myself into oblivion, but hey, we're here and we're ready to get going, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is my second drinker's VIP lounge in the space of like a week or two, so yeah, this is becoming kind of a regular thing, but it's really good fucking fun, um, and so... We've uh, we've basically got someone in tonight. Um, we we got talking on Twitter basically. Um, you know he's been in some of the, my favorite movies. Um, he's been in like Rambo Four. He's been in Black Hawk Down. He's <laughs> well, he's been in one of the Resident Evil movies as well. But we'll get to that. Um, and yeah, he's an all round really fucking cool guy. And uh, I'm I'm really keen to to talk to him tonight and um, yeah, get his insight into well what it's like. Um, transitioning from British, like, acting over to Hollywood, um, what it's like being in action movies, what it's like working with Sylvester Stallone, uh, and what it's like dealing with the bullshit that's, uh, that's kind of infesting Hollywood these days, so hopefully it should make for a pretty interesting conversation. So, without further ado, I'll bring him in. We have got Matthew Marston. Hello, sir! How you doing, sir? Nice to meet you. Excellent. It's uh, honestly, man. Uh, I was just saying there. Like, it took a while to get this arranged because you know we've we've got schedules and stuff, and uh, time's always against us. But uh, I'm glad you were able to join us for this tonight, man. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be on, mate. Yeah, it's funny. According to all the woke on Twitter, like you know, I'm not working, so you <laughs> wouldn't believe that I had a difficult schedule and I just finished the movie on Friday. But you know, you know how it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, people, people like that, you know, they uh, they hate success and they hate people just doing well. Uh, yeah. And so you know, it's it's great to just laugh at them most of the time. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. But yeah, man. Uh, I mean. I, I I'm obviously dead keen to just get, start talking about Rambo and stuff like that, but I should I should do this, do this chronologically, you know, go back okay. to the beginning. So, um, you've obviously got a pretty long career that started like way back in the '90s. Like you, for British viewers, they would know you from from things like Emmerdale and from um, uh, Coronation Street, which is like yeah. a fucking British institution at this point. That thing's like older than <laughs> older than America almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was uh, it was a great, you know, I look at it like repertory theatre, you know, like you go into a soap. And look, when you start off as an actor, you know, nobody in the UK really, I mean, certainly when I started off, you know, it was before reality television, before reality television and, <laughs> you know, before Instagram and before YouTube fame, um, you know, you, you never thought that you were actually going to make any money out of it. You know, you're going to be stuck in some kind of like, you know, regional theatre and you'll be doing it because you love it. And hopefully at some point, you know, you might get the opportunity to do a movie and then, you know, eventually go to Hollywood. But you don't really think that it's going to progress, you know, uh, unless you have a lot of connections. I didn't have any connections in the industry. You know, I was just, you know, working class kid from West Brom, you know. So uh, I went out wanting to wanting to be an actor because I loved it. You know, I, I grew up loving Rocky and Rambo and all those films and, and just wanted to to come over to the States, you know, and, um, and yeah, so, you know, the first opportunity I got was Emmerdale, which, you know, it's a job, you, you know, you take it and it's just at that point, it was the third biggest show on TV. And, uh, and then, uh, I did like, I think three months on that. And then I came out and then the next audition I actually got was for, for Corey and I got it. And I went, I went and got, uh, went into Coronation Street. So, um, and that was a really weird experience, you know, because I actually never watched Coronation Street. Um, right. I used to watch. I used to watch the other guys on the other side, you know, the Cockneys. Uh, but um, so I, you know, every day I'd go, and because people don't realize, you used to work six weeks in advance, right? So you go and you go. I'd walk up. I'd get my sani, you know, go and get my sandwich down at the at the the shop down the street, Granada Studios, and I'd walk back, and nobody give a shit about me walking past you know they were waiting to see all the other people and then it dropped on my birthday uh, in uh, 1997 and that was it it was just <laughs> like the world changed i couldn't go down the street anymore and you know it was at a time where the show was evolving and brian park had come in and killed off some favorite characters and so it was it was just mental you know to go from nobody knowing who you were to people coming up in the streets and talking to you it was bonkers. 
It must have been a cool yeah. experience, though, in a lot of ways, you know, just to, to get that kind of overnight fame. Um... Yeah, it was. I mean, like I said, for me, it was more about the craft, right? It was like getting in there and do my job. And then, oh, there was this other stuff that, that was going on as well. I wasn't really prepared for it. And that's why, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for a lot of people that, that at a young age you just get very, very famous. And, you know, nobody says no to you. Right, yeah. just nobody says no to you, and uh, and so that happened to me overnight. Really, it was an overnight thing. Third of March, nineteen ninety-seven, crazy, and the tabloids. And and what was weird was people would pay more attention at then to to the soap stars than they would the movie stars. Like the movie stars, like oh, the movie stars were doing their thing, but you know, soaps like that was the big, a really really huge deal for the British press anyway. Um, so it was, it was very peculiar and, you know, to be honest with you, I was like, this isn't what I got into it for. I'm an actor. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to act. So when I left and I was only for one year, you know, got the best newcomer award at the national television awards, which I, I was hammered drunk. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, I like well, it. <laughs> I, I, was, I was absolutely smashed when I got that because I was like, this is really embarrassing. Like, I'm not going to win this. And I'm at the Royal Albert Hall and I just remember going up there and, getting the award and I can't remember what I said. One day I'll look back at it, I guess, on the video. Uh, and that was it. And then I wanted to carry on and do other things. So I left and, and you know, I was very fortunate after then, you know? I mean, I was going to say as well, like, because with these soaps, um, you get a lot of actors who just kind of settle into that comfort zone, like, especially with things like Coronation Street, where it's been running for decades and um, you get people that have just been in with the bricks almost, and that's basically their whole career. It's just like doing that one character, never kind of moving beyond it because it's like a steady paycheck. Um, and I suppose there's always that temptation because it's just, it's easy money almost. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, it's, you get a job, you can go home every night. You know, the fans are amazing, honestly. I mean, the, the show back then was was had a lot of good stuff going in it like i said it's very challenging when you have to do like six or seven or eight or even nine scenes a day and you get into movies and you have three scenes to do a day it's like this is easy you know yeah. and, and often no dialogue you know you're just running around doing stuff so you know I, but i understand why they do it though because i mean look i got to play at wembley i got to play at main road uh, you know in a celebrity football game and i was living a great life you know but it's it w wasn't what i wanted for my career i wanted to challenge myself and do i'm not saying bigger things because you know it's that's a huge thing but i just wanted to challenge myself as an actor and i didn't if you get into acting for job security you're a moron right <laughs> i didn't get into it for job security you know i got into it because i wanted to explore these things as an artist you know yeah and well i mean you, I, I guess you made that decision then to try and move over to the states and see if you could make it in Hollywood. And like, I know you you got a role in Black Hawk Down, which is mm -hmm. you know still hands down one of the best war movies I've ever seen. Just absolutely yeah. fantastic action, um, great attention to detail, and great like historical accuracy. Like, I know they tried to get it pretty uh, pretty close to what really went down, like the timeline of events and everything. Um, I mean, how did that come about then? Like, how did you make that move over to Hollywood? Well, I always wanted to come to Hollywood eventually, you know, but I, I did see it as, I mean, the, the great thing about British actors normally, unless you, you get a break, is there's a filter, right? So you come out of college or drama school or whatever, and then you go into theater. And then if you can break out of theater, normally you'll get some television role, and then you break out of television into British films. And then, I mean, it's slightly changed now with the demand for things like Game of Thrones and, 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 um, the Lord of the Rings stuff where they really wanted British actors in or the crown. But back then it was like, you got to get yourself into like an independent British movie and then you might get noticed on the world stage. And what happened for me was I got a, I got a role um, in a movie with Michael Caine called China. And at the time that was a movie, like Michael said to me, he said, this is the role I was born to play. Like this should really be for him another Oscar winner. And when he was, when we shot that movie, he got the Oscar for Side Hours Rules. So there was a lot of attention 
on uh, on that particular film and they were like hey who's this kid and i went off for a year and i trained as a boxer um and, and got did went really method and uh and so there was a lot of attention of hey who's in this movie like andy circus was in that film and he just got a role in this like little trilogy that he was <laughs> yeah. film, you just know? some crazy mocap that he was doing you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no it one will so ever talk about it dude it's so funny because that was the movie that he did before he went right so uh, i remember asking him like oh you do you're gonna do lord of the rings because that was all um all that was cast like i never auditioned for that all that was cast um i was doing other stuff before then so so anyways um uh, I, I did that film, I did Shiner, and I started getting calls from Hollywood. And it was agents, and they were like, hey, oh, and I was uh, auditioning for um, Star Wars. And at that point, nobody knew what was going on with the prequels. It's just Lucas is making the prequels, right? Mm -hmm. So I was a huge Star Wars fan, huge Star Wars fan. And so I started auditioning for it. And it just so, so back then, it was an audition with like a camera and a little like mini DV like cassette. So what you do is you'd film yourself. It's not like now where you could just kind of sound so old where you can just like drop onto your computer, you know, go onto like uh, uh, iMovie and just cut a little quick thing on there and send it off by, by a um, WeTransfer or whatever. You had to mm. send the physical tape off. So I did like three auditions and I was, I was getting through the stages. Bop, 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 bop. And I was right to the last stage. And it was, it was a cast narrator called Robin Gerland. And she said, listen, we need your tape to come in. This is the final hurdle. And I'm like, because I, obviously being a fan of Star Wars, I knew that they'd done this in the past and they took like four groups or five groups of people to Skywalker Ranch, right? And they would swap them, swap the different people out to get that, that, um, that ensemble cast. So that was going on. And of course, everyone's asking who are these people getting through to the final rounds? Because Hollywood is like, it's all about, a, you know, you don't want the other person to miss, you don't want to miss out on someone, right? So if someone says, oh, this actor is going to be the next big thing, it shoots, it rockets around Hollywood and everyone puts in offers for that person. It's just the way it works, right? So they'd said to me, oh, you're getting down to the final line on this. So I started getting these calls like, hey, and I had a couple of managers come over and they, they said to me, will you come to Hollywood? Anyway, and I was finishing up the film and I couldn't get my tape in. I couldn't get the last tape in because I was doing a night shoot. Um, so the way it worked is FedEx. So I miss FedEx wouldn't have made it in time for the cut. So I, just, oh. I didn't get the last one. Um, and I still, to this day, don't know what the role was. I mean, looking back, it's, it's weird to try and figure it out, right? Because the first one, it wouldn't have been Anakin. So maybe because I'm tall, it probably could have been for the second one. Anyway, um, so then I flew over to LA uh, with my manager and Black Hawk Down was, was one of the first auditions that I, I did. And I think that, you know, back then there was a you know, all the up and coming young actors that people are interested in uh, were were pulled in for that movie. So I went and uh, I'll never forget it because they, they said to me, hey, listen, you got to go and meet Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheim. I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me, right? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna go and so I'm like what? Uh, and so, yeah, and that was it. And I, I went there and got the job and the majority of us didn't know what roles we got. We didn't have a script. We had the book. So they gave us the book that we read and then, you know, sent us off to Fort Benning to, to train. And then we went over to Morocco and then we knew who we were playing. Nice. I mean, what was the, you know, shooting in Morocco, obviously it's going to be intensely hot. It's going to be difficult shooting on location. Like what was the experience like of doing that? You know, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I mean, the guys that were in that movie, um, if I saw any of them today, it's like a brotherhood. It really is. Now, I think that that was one of the great things that doing the, the training did is that when you go through, um, you know, so I played uh, an army ranger 
Now, it's kind of like, you know, like the SAS and the paras, like mm -hmm. the majority of the people in the SAS come from the parachute regiment, not all of them, but the majority. So the majority of Delta come from the army, from the Ranger regiment. So you train with the, with the army Rangers and what they do is they tell you, you have a Ranger buddy and you can't go anywhere without your Ranger buddy. So they go for you, when you go to the toilet, they go with you. When you, you, everywhere you go, they, you know, you go together. They put us through this really intense training schedule and it really was intense and then at the end of it they um they gave us a letter from the guys that died and that was you know very moving you know it was really moving and um and then so we were we were stuck together and then we went to morocco i know it sounds stupid but we all had what's called a hind tight right which is the shaved head around the side and it's it, it's a very it, it was back then the haircut for the army rangers so when you go out in morocco you'd see a high and tight and you knew it was one of the crew or one of the battalion the rangers that were out there with us so what it did was it gelled us you know we really came together as a tight unit and i think that that shows in the film actually i think that you know we everyone took it very seriously uh, the training very seriously the handling the firearms very seriously and I think that all that came together in this um, in in this amazing kind of experience. That I mean, you look back at the movie and you see, well, goodness me, look at all the people that were in it. You yeah, know what I mean, I mean, it was it was a very special film. It, so. I mean, it's a it's a huge cast of, of actors that's in it, and um, yeah, there's obviously like they're trying to uh, cover a lot of of stuff going on, and so there's there's lots of different POV characters and. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine. Like, yeah, it, it's um, there's going to be a real sense of camaraderie just with so many of you like working together on such a big project like this. And yeah, man, yeah. it must have just been a crazy like trip for for you. Like, okay, a few years ago I was on Emmerdale in like filming in the Yorkshire Dales or something. Now I'm in Morocco shooting guns, blowing things up, and you know, just doing this incredible action movie and working with. You know some of the biggest names in the in the business at that point yeah um yeah yeah awesome. it's, but you know it's one of those things like you just do what you do and in your mind you're like okay this is the progression right like oh i did coronation street so i'm going off and doing something else and oh okay i've got an english movie oh okay i've got an american movie and but but it is like like if you're a normal person it's weird. It is a weird kind of out of body experience. I mean, certainly when you're turning up and you're having people coming up and shaking your hands and you're like, that was Will Smith that just came over and said, well done. Or yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, because I'm fans of these actors as well. And I'm a, I'm a movie buff, you know, I love film. So, you know, when Ridley Scott comes up to him, he goes, listen, mate, you're going to go down there. Okay. Right. You're going to run boom explosion. Okay. Okay. Right. And that, that'd be it. And you'd be like, what am I doing? Hang on. Go, <laughs> right. That's why it's so chaotic on the film. <clears throat> so yeah, it, it was, it was an amazing experience, but you always, you think, okay, this is Black Hawk Down. And then all I'm going to do is blockbuster movies from here on in. And it's always going to be like this. And, but I did say to Ian Virgo, uh, who played Waddell, um, because a lot of us went to Hollywood afterwards. Uh, and it was like, we were the golden kids in there, you know, like we, we got, we were going in for all the big jobs. And I said to Ian, I said, listen, I know that this isn't real, right? Like this could all end tomorrow and this could be the last film we ever do, right? Because, but what you really want to try and do on Hollywood, in Hollywood is like ride the wave, right? So you want to get a film, shoot a film, you want to get a film while you're doing that film in case that film doesn't do well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you got another one backing, backing that up, you know, so, uh, the trick is to try and just keep going and then people will bring you on, um, you know, given the strength of your reputation or the films that are coming out, you know, and that's, that's how you, you know, that's how you keep seeing the same people in all these films. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, you obviously kind of, um, you transitioned into another action movie after this. It's like, you know, it's a little known franchise that people might have heard of, um, starring a, a, a character called Rambo. 
and yeah. um <laughs> yeah like you obviously this was a much bigger role for you because you're playing uh schoolboy um the sniper yeah. from from rambo well it's just called rambo basically but um yeah rambo 4 essentially and Man, I, I really like that movie because I, I've gone on record to say that I wasn't a big fan of Rambo Last Blood. And I think Rambo 4 just would have been a great way to end it. You know, he goes back to his family ranch and he's, he's come back to America again and he's put his past behind him. But be that as it may, um, yeah, like obviously you doing that, you got the opportunity to work for Sylvester Stallone, which is not a bad thing to be doing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like that, how did... that... Sorry, go on. I was gonna say, yeah. What was it like, like the first time you met him? Were you breaking it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a weird experience. I'll, I'll tell you the the whole story on that because for for Rambo fans or you know. By the way, I agree with you. With Last Blood. I watched that and uh, I wasn't a fan of it. To be honest, as a as a movie, I just you know it didn't do anything for me. But you know, okay. So I get a phone call from my manager, and and he's like, um, Matt. <laughs> they're doing Rambo and they want to see you. and I'm like they're doing what they're doing, they're doing. and he's like he's like you know there's, a, there's like this like elitist attitude about Rambo right and I was like yeah I want to go and, and meet on it so anyway I can't remember if I got, a, got the script or I got the sides because normally I, I'll ask for the script because they have this stupid thing in Hollywood where they give you the sides and I'm like, how can I know the character, right? Because you have to put the character, as you know, as you've commented many times on your, uh, on your, on your um, character arcs and, and storylines is, is that you need to know the entirety of the character, like where he is in this, in this arc, right? From hmm. beginning and the end. So anyway, I got the, I think I got the script and I read it through and they said, we want you to come in for this SAS guy called Lewis. I was like, okay. And Schoolboy was actually a Navy SEAL. And at the, at the end of the original screenplay, Schoolboy goes with Rambo and Rambo becomes Troutman and Schoolboy goes off and he becomes the new Rambo. Oh, okay. So they're almost setting up like a, a spin-off or something. Yeah, yeah. We see, uh, this is pre-Creed. Don't forget, right? So I think that what Sly was doing was, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like kind of less work, but still on the like on the franchise, so you can go off and be more like the like the scalpel. He was the the blunt instrument and schoolboy. Because I mean, who's gonna take over from Rambo? You can't. So, but schoolboy was gonna be this like you know. Uh, a scalpel of a, of a special operations guy. So anyway, I go and I read for it, and I, I know a lot of these guys, right? And they are the the grey men, right? They're not brash, they're not arrogant, they're not gobby. So that's how I played it. I went in and I played it, you know, actually very different to the way Graham did it. And Graham did great, right? Graham Graham's take on the character was fantastic for the film, and and I love Graham, and he's a great guy. Um, so it's not a, but you know, every actor has a different take and I played against it. And, um, and so they called me up and they're like, Hey, um, number one, uh, they want you for schoolboy. And I was like, Holy crap, that's the lead. It was like, you know, Rambo and then schoolboy in the original script and Sly's going to call you. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, so so keep your phone free. And so I get off the phone. I'm like, nobody pick up the phone. Like, yeah. no, I'm like you do not pick up that phone. So anyway, he calls me. I'm like, hey, um, are you around to hang out tomorrow? And I'm like, hang on, let me just. Yeah, yes, I am. Of course I am. Yeah. So uh, I go down to, uh, I won't say where his office is, but he's got this, this office in Beverly Hills. And, and I go into Beverly Hills and. You know, I walk in, there's all the Rambo stuff and the Rocky stuff, memorabilia all around. And and he comes out and he's like the size of a house. Like his shoulders are like, yeah. I mean, he was training heavy for that. And yeah. he was big. Um, and so anyway, he comes in, shakes my hand and we go into his office and we just start talking about the character. And I start talking to him about... He goes, I, I want to play, I want Schoolboy to be British. I don't want him to be American. I don't want him to be a SEAL. And so I suggested that he was a SBS guy. 
you know, because, you know, the Royal Marines were the original Green Berets. I said it'd be a nice nod to the history and blah, blah, blah. Start talking about guns. Um, and then he gets up and he kind of like, you know, he walks across the room like this with his giant shoulders. And he puts a DVD in the DVD player and goes and sits down behind his desk and, and presses play. And it's pa 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 And I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding. You've got <laughs> to be kidding. And he plays me the trailer for Rocky Balboa. Yeah. I grew up loving Rocky. Like, Rocky was the character for me that said, you can do anything you want if you work at it, right? Yeah. Like, you can, you can be up there. You can go to Hollywood and do it if you work hard, right? Um, and so I watched it, and I knew immediately that movie was going to be good, right? I yeah. knew, I knew. Like, and I turned around and looked at him like that, and I smiled, and he went, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So then we go over to um, we go over to uh, Thailand, and that was an experience because the Burmese had put like um, a thread out on all of our lives. So um, that was interesting. Yeah, like being surrounded by Thai special forces protecting us, and um, and then you know I get a script, and you know so I think Balboa went out around in, in between the time that that and the, and our film was shooting. I think. Anyway, I get a, I get a rewrite of the script, and it's like changed. Yeah. And he came up, and he went, "I'm sorry, Matt." And I'm like, "Listen, I'm a fan of Rambo. What am I going to say? I thought the end of it was perfect. You know, like yeah. going home. He's finally come home. I'm like, I, when you're a fan of the franchise, like I'm not going to be a selfish asshole and go, "Why is my franchise out okay? there?" I'm like, listen. You got to be right. You got to do right to the character, and that was a great ending for me. Yeah. Apart from they did another one. <laughs> yeah, there there is that. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, like, you know, it's interesting hearing this um, because I didn't, I, I didn't know that it was like casting that far back before Balboa had even come out, um, which is yeah, it's awesome. It must have been cool to see that trailer for the first time. I mean, I remember seeing Rocky Balboa in the cinema and just being on my feet like at the end i just fucking loved it um i think they did you know such a, a great um redemption for the character after rocky five which was depressing as fuck um you know they, they really brought him back and the fact that they were able to make it work after like so many years obviously sly was pushing 60 at that point so it's kind of a tough sell but they more or less got away with it and yeah it was just one of those movies that you couldn't help but enjoy and then he obviously did Rambo as well. And it was like that period where he was just revisiting a lot of these these old characters that he'd done. And again, you know, I think they, they did a great job with, with Rambo. You know, it wasn't a, a hugely yeah. complex story, but it didn't need to be. That's, they don't have to be, do they? I mean, this is the problem. You don't have to, like, inject a lot of different things into it or, or make this story overcomplicated. It was a, a good old, you know... I remember Walter Hill telling me that every movie is a Western, right? And, right. and, um, and it's funny because I look at Rambo and I'm like, look, it's a very, very simple story. It's, formu it's kind of formulaic, right? I mean, it's like, you know, people go, go up the, into the jungle, get captured, people come in, save them big fight at the end all right okay i'm down with that but you know i think that he does not get the credit that he should do as an actor because he's a really really good actor like he knows what he wants and to come back i mean how many actors could come back 30 years after the first movie and nail the character again and make you care about him mm -hmm. right and because I, I think balboa was fantastic and i actually asked him i, I said um do you think because you know those movies just got bigger and bigger and bigger right i mean the budget went up and up and up and up and balboa it was a small budget again and i said did that help you you know did the restrictions in the budget actually help you because you start focusing more on the characters and the story and not the you know the big sets and and all that and he said yeah it did and that was um that was a really interesting you know, thing to see with him and, and his process. And the dude never stops working. Mm. He works so damn hard. Really, he's, he's amazing. 
I mean, he, yeah, he deservedly got an Oscar nomination for his work on Creed. Like, again, yeah. wasn't a huge fan of the Creed movies in concept, but, like, Stallone's performance, like, he, he should have won that Oscar because I thought it was fantastic. And, yeah, I I think, you know, people obviously tend to, to look down on guys like him because he was a big 80s action star. And, you know, he did a lot of the, the big muscular action movies where it was all just about you know the guns the the big muscles and everything going around shirtless um because that was the fashion at the time but like beneath it all there's a guy who one is is a pretty fucking good actor and like you say he, he's got an incredible work ethic uh and two is a really good writer as well like he, he really writer. understands characters um you know even in in the worst of it like where he would uh you know he'd be doing those like Rocky three and four and stuff like, uh, um, you know, which are just big bombastic kind of, um, you know, adrenaline fueled movies. Oh, they're great. Like I fucking love them, but they're not, yeah. they're not complicated. But even then he would, he would inject little moments of character into, into like even the, the most cartoonish antagonists. And, uh, it just showed that he had that, that underlying like understanding of how to write a good character and how to humanize them and how to give them a little bit of complexity um, and yeah, it comes out in his later work, um, obviously, because he's got more maturity and he's got more time to develop stuff like that. And yeah, man, like it, it's great that he had that um, those twin successes of like Rocky Balboa and the Rambo Four, because in that period, like the the late nineties, early two thousands, like he was in a bit of a slump career wise. Yeah. Like he'd had a string of flops, didn't seem to know what to do as an actor anymore. Uh, the 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 straight up action movies weren't necessarily working for him anymore and it, you know it's it felt like you know that era of the action star was kind of dying out and then he just reinvented himself he brought back these classic characters as older guys now because you know he was he was, he was getting on a bit um although fuck me you wouldn't know it like he, he can still run no. about like a guy half his age um but he was able well, to bring a, them back that way there's an interesting moment when we were doing uh when we were doing rambo there's a point where you know julie and myself and sly are running up this hill there's a lot of frigging running in that movie like yeah. a lot of running it's kind of like you know lord of the rings the first one it's like let's run over some hills and let's do some more running over more hills but we were running up and down and, and he says to me take point and he comes down the hill and because sometimes you know you'll do it on a rehearsal so just shoot the rehearsal so we shot it and he runs up he comes down and we just go boom <laughs> oh and it shit was like oh dude he was solid he was absolutely rock solid and i was like okay you know and by the way you know this is one of the things i love about him there was a part where you know where they eat the pigs are eating the legs uh of, of the yeah. guy that's okay so there were obviously real pigs and it was a real uh, you know piles of shit everywhere and he goes hey you move those over because he's he's obviously he's directing right he's, he's at the monitors he's looking he goes move those over there blah, blah, blah. and they don't put it in the right place and he jumps down gets up to his knees in pig shit like, you know, <laughs> waddles over moves the pigs right now i know people that wouldn't you know of his stature that, that they would never ever ever go anywhere near that you know but he is he doesn't have that that mentality you know mm -hmm. and i think i think that you know like i said i love the i love rocky three you know i still put eye of the Tri tiger on when i yeah. go for a ride i still <laughs> like that soundtrack is amazing um but yeah they were different movies but if you go back to the first one it's a fine performance and people yeah. back then were talking about him in the same breath as pacino and and de niro you know i mean he was really seen as the next big thing and i remember you know he he was compared think about this he wins an oscar for writing he becomes the biggest movie star in the world and then his body's compared with mr olympia <laughs> how many lifetimes would you have to live to get one of those right at, at yeah. all so he's a he's a he's a really amazing person you know and actually very humble yeah he's just he, he yeah he's obviously had that just incredible drive to succeed 
you know, throughout his career. And mm -hmm. it, it's carried him all this way. And it's, man, it's to be respected. I mean, you know, even now, in his mid-70s, like, he's still in phenomenal shape. He obviously, like, yeah. still works out hard and uh, keeps pushing himself to the limits of what he can do. Um, doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. I mean, it's it's commendable, man. It really is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's just doesn't feel like there's many movie stars like that now. You know, that that kind of uh, just forced their way in just through sheer determination. Yeah, well, if you look at people like him and and even Spielberg, right? Like you look at who's arguably the best director alive, right? Arguably. And he, like, kind of basically jumped over the wall at Universal and blagged his way in to get a gig. Like, you, you couldn't do that right now. No. Um, but I also <laughs> think that there was, there's a movement about, and this is a whole thing that we can have another discussion about, like, uh, is there's a reason why, like, those guys came back, right? Because watching those kind of things, we, we love watching heroes. We, we love watching men that we can aspire to be like. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if you think about it, even now, if you look at the action stars, you might say that Brad Pitt is one, right? Because Brad Pitt's one. These guys are in their 50s, 60s, Tom Cruise, you know, in his 60s, he's nearly 60 or whatever. And yeah. it's because the, there was never really the ushering in of the next generation. I mean, there used to be back in the day with the studio system, You'd have your Spencer Tracy's or whatever, and then then there'd be like the other guy that would come up underneath him that would take the mantle, and then you know he would be that leading man. But I think that what we did was you know the with the early um, the early kind of even if you go back, you'll see it the pushing of the message as you like to say right <laughs> the, the message, message. the message has actually been going on for a long time, although it was a little bit more subtle. And so what they did was kind of like in, in they didn't want strong men out there like you can't have strong men because you know you have someone like stallone and schwarzenegger in a movie and nobody's going to believe that um you know a woman could ever overpower them right so so that was changed even though as as we were saying before um just before we came on is that there are other ways that women can win um uh, and and you know that's a viable strategy and just you know cunning or or you know using their wiles or i always say this like you know that i did helen of troy it wasn't called paris of troy it was called helen of troy because she was the one that made everything happen so i think mm -hmm. that there was a, you know there's been like a dumbing down of that guy right like that male hero and what they realize hollywood realizes i i've literally been in those meetings where they go well i don't understand why like american sniper was such a hit i'm like everybody else in the world understands why it's a hit yeah right i mean you know it's a strong male character with a great storyline fantastic director and you wonder why it's a hit and you wonder why these other things aren't a hit because you're kind of like fudging and trying to you know push these things in you can still have these character conflicts, right? Without actually pushing this thing, this narrative that is antithetical to everything that we know in the real world. It, it's always treated as like some kind of seesaw nowadays where, um, well, when you were mentioning female characters there, it's like, well, in order to have strong female characters in a movie, we have to make the male characters weak to balance weak. that out. Yeah. It's like, no, you don't. Like, they were able to do this perfectly well in movies from like the 80s and 90s you know the, the ones we reference are things like aliens where it's like ripley's a fantastically strong character she's not a kick-ass fighter initially she has to like grow into that role over the course of the movie and it doesn't mean that the male characters have to get diminished to accommodate her they're still great at what they do um but ultimately they fall you know they fall victim they get killed by the aliens and it's just like her at the end um so you don't have to you don't have to do that but it's like they can't get their heads around that now now it, it, it's purely got to be well if we have strong female characters in this movie the men have to be kind of useless and whiny and effeminate and just bleh, you know they're awful to look at and you know when you talk about movies that have been surprise hits or whatever the other one that that's the biggest movie of the year practically has been top gun maverick where yeah. again you got an awesome kick-ass uh, male lead like it, you know it almost felt like something that was outlawed at this point it's like hey tom cruise is coming back he's older 
but he's still fucking great at what he does, and he's able to show the young pilots like how it's done through experience and wisdom and hard won, uh, you know, grit and determination. Um, yeah, and that becomes this massive hit that people flock to see. And why? Because you're, that's finally a movie that's given people what they've been looking for for years now and not been getting from like the the rest of Hollywood. It's such yeah, a right. it, it's such okay. an obvious thing to people like us because we see it, but like it's like the people who make the films fucking don't. It's weird. Well, I think the actual the well now you've got Jerry Bruckheimer. Who know, I mean, I know Jerry personally. He knows how to make a hit, right? He understands what what is popular. I mean. You don't stay at the top of the game for all that period of time without understanding that. Now, and here's the funny thing about, about Top Gun Maverick. There was a diverse cast. There was. I don't see anyone complaining about that because I totally bought it. It was completely, you know, within the realms of reality. I mean, even if you go back to, you know, the characters in Aliens, Aliens is probably one of the best examples, right? Is, you know, you have Ripley and guess what? She cannot stand there and duke it out with that massive alien so what does she do she puts on that exoskeleton and then mm. goes on and does it because she needs help that doesn't change the fact that she's a badass mm -hmm. right she's still a badass but she understands that she cannot defeat that a that queen alien without help with it without some other way of enhancing her physically right yes to, to do that but but again and she used same thing with sarah connor right sarah connor used the smarts to, you know there there are other ways of doing it but it's this weird thing that that, that some people will say look physically a, a a physical um it always has to be a physical advantage right that's what it has to be and like you say like because people know that's not the case for the most part is they have to weaken down the men instead of letting the you know they'll, they'll make the women stronger but weaken down the men when you know the rest of apart from obviously bill paxton's character and that and and the slimy guys in it but all the other marines are doing their job right they're yeah. not weak or they're not like you know that they might come up short right against the superior um enemy but they're not weakened by it right so i i think there is a weird thing it's it's mainly on physically you know physicality if you think about it it's not necessarily on smarts although you know hollywood does like to make uh especially fathers like the dumbest fuckers around <laughs> yeah <Excuse> my language. <laughs> like dads are completely stupid i mean i was in a meeting the other day and they're like well i think we should do this with the and, and the father should lead you know learn from the kids i'm like absolutely not no that's not the way it works yeah. Right? It, it just it just doesn't you can come to a realization yourself by observing but there's no way like a 10 year old kid is going to teach you you know uh, uh, anything that is better about life it's just not true i i remember this uh this thing that was going around on twitter like a good few years ago now but it was it was like um harmful stereotypes in tv commercials and one of them it was like this usual bitching session and it was like, can we do away with this stereotype of like the, um, you know, the pretty um, wife who's always like, you know, looks great and, and is able to like, you know, run a home and everything because, um, you know, like real life isn't like that. It's chaotic and like trying to like look after kids and, and have a job and like all that stuff is really difficult and it's a really harmful stereotype to enforce. Uh, and I was like, okay, fine. How about we also do away with the stereotype of like the bumbling, useless, incompetent dad who ha who can't do anything right? Like, because that's equally bullshit. <laughs> like, yeah, no, but yeah, no one seems to have a problem with that, you know? Yeah, there is this kind of sanitizing, and 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 a lot of the times, like I was saying this the other day, a lot of the companies just don't believe this bullshit. They're just told by their like the the, the people underneath them that that is what the world wants, and mm. then they wonder why everything tanks. Right, they wonder why these these movies tank and why other movies do better. And the funny thing is, like, I got a call the other day. They're like, after Top Gun came out, right? It was like studios are looking for um, military films, like pro. I'm like, listen, if you didn't see what all the anti, you know, military movies did over the years that didn't make any money whatsoever, right? Because people don't want to see this. Look, you and I know, right? We are we are from the same area of the world. I always wanted the Americans to be the to be the heroes. Like I always wanted yeah. them to win. I did. I, I, you know, it's just it's just I did, and that didn't matter what color they were. 
it was just or, or you know whatever the you know immutable characters the characteristics they had you know you need a hero you want to have a hero to look up to and there's nothing wrong with that right there's nothing wrong but now everything's kind of been uh and even when it comes to flaws like we say like watching love and thunder the other day good grief like they just, <laughs> i mean look it's, i always say this nobody sets out to make a bad movie right and i've been in some bad movies but nobody sets out to be to make a bad movie you'll read the script it's like michael kane you know looks at potentially himself, potentially him. ryan johnson might have but <laughs> <laughs> But, but, you know, you don't, you think that it's the, it's going to be the best that it can be. You make the decisions and look a lot of the times, especially when you play with the big boys, with the studios, they come in and they'll just take your edit, you know, and they'll re-edit it and they'll do all these kind of things. But nobody actually sets out to make a bad film. They don't. So, you know, when you're approaching the film process, it's a very, very complicated one. But what you have to start with is a good bloody story. You know what I mean? Like start with a good story. And as you know, there are the archetypes and, and we, we move away from, you know, those, you know, heroic figures and try and change them too much, right? Like it's good to have someone who has to overcome adversity. We all know that. Rock is a classic example of it. You don't have someone come in that's perfect at the beginning. You just don't. And also, you, what you don't do is you take a character that everybody loves, right? And like Thor, and you make him a cuck. Mm -hmm. Because that's what they made Chris Hemsworth. They took away... I mean, the main thing is he's the most masculine of all of the, the Marvel characters. You know, and, and look, we all liked his little, like, the, the humor between him and, um, and Chris. Right, like that. That's fun. That's a fun little bit of like you know because we all recognise it because dudes do that down the bar, right? Like we do it down the pub. We have that like little bit of banter. But to take him away, to make him this bumbling guy who doesn't know who he is, like the first, the first. I, I mean, I don't really count Dark World. I can't even remember that movie because I didn't enjoy it. No but, one remembers Dark World. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's just a. I don't know what happened there. But it was a genuine character arc, right? It's, you know, directed by Branner, who understands character, you know, he understands that kind of, uh, you know, how important character development is. And that it's almost like if you were to put those two movies back to back, you'd be like, those are completely different characters. I, d I don't understand them. They're so different. And it was ruined for me. Like 10 minutes in, it's funny because I've got 10 minutes in, and I knew that you'd said like, that this is a pile of crap, right? And, and I, I was like, I was on the plane, I'm like, uh, I was gonna watch Bullet Train and I was like, oh, I'm fine down. <laughs> and, and 10 minutes in, I was like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah. Like these decisions were horrible, so. Yeah, there, there's so many of these movies, right? That uh, they scored it big first time around and it's like they tried to double down on everything that they put in them and failed miserably, like, for example, you, you had the first Wonder Woman movie. Pretty good film, you know? There, there's a few, like, things I could pick apart in terms of the writing, but, like, generally, I think she's a good character. Gal Gadot was a great choice to cast her. Um, you know, the action scenes are great, and overall, everyone liked it. Then they they learned all the wrong lessons from that film. They did Wonder Woman 1984, and it was utter garbage. Like, terrible story. There's no real villain in it. The, the morality of it is completely fucked. Disaster. Everyone hated it. Um, you had, like you say, the, the first revamped Thor with Ragnarok, um, where Taika Waititi came in and he took something that, like, Kenneth Branagh had done his best with it, but I think he'd, try, he'd made it a bit stodgy and a bit serious. Yeah. And it wasn't working within the Marvel mold. Like, it's not like a Marvel product. Um, and so he, he made it funny and that was successful short term but then it's like he was given free reign to do whatever he wanted with the next one put zero fucking effort in just was in it to just dick around and have fun just whatever idea popped into his head he would just film it um, and it was garbage as a result like you say yeah. the, the, it was a terrible movie and it's the same with, with uh, Black Panther and Wakanda Forever the first Black Panther movie <laughs> I could debate like whether it's good or not It's I don't think it is but it was a cultural moment and made like 1.3 or 1.4 billion dollars 
Everyone was raving about it. They did. They tried to repeat that success again. They tried to make it another cultural moment with Wakanda Forever. Didn't work. It was a garbage story. Um, you know, tried to play on the sympathy vote for for Chadwick's passing, which was you know tragic. But you can't base a movie around that really. And again, that's it's not flopping, but it's not making anywhere near the money. It's probably going to top out at like eight hundred million, and that's barely breaking even. And yeah, again, I mean, like I mean, it's just happening again and again. This shit. Well, I mean, look, look. Going back to Branagh, like you hire a guy that is his wheelhouse is Shakespeare. You're gonna yeah. get a heavy. You're gonna get a heavier hand on it, right? He's gonna focus on those things that he considers to be important. So therefore, like you said, yeah, I mean, it, it probably needed a little bit of, you know, oomph in it. But what it did was it set the tone, right? Like it, it set the tone. You knew that like Thor was this petulant like god that that thought everything should be given to him, and his dad was trying to teach him a lesson by stripping him down and throwing him throwing him back yeah. to earth, right? So I get it. I, I I understand that. A lot of that's to do with like who you hire, right? If you hire him, he's going to give you that. If you hire um, uh, what's his name, Taki? Okay, oh, I can never get his name right. Taika. 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 You, yeah. you, you're going to get that. By the way, I, I thought that it felt to me like it was almost like they didn't have a script and they were like, "Hey, just just improv it." Right? I think that's how he get... does things, though. Like I, I've yeah, seen it's... some of the behind the scenes stuff, and it's literally like he'll just come up with an idea, like, "Oh, wouldn't it be funny if we did this?" And fuck it, okay, we'll set up an entire scene and we'll film it. Spend however many millions of dollars doing each of these things. And then, like you said, there was a, a cut of the movie that was like three and a half, four hours long, just with all this garbage in it that he just thought up on the fly. And they had to try and edit it down to something. But it's like they didn't have a cohesive script and they had no clue what they were trying to do with it. It was just yeah, him it's, being given too much freedom. You know, it's funny. There's oftentimes British actors and American actors have very different approaches to a script. So I'm very anal about learning the entire script, right? And getting it like understanding that, you know, because I look at a script like this, like so there's a reason why, you'll know this, you're a writer. There's a reason why you write that line, right? There shouldn't be any fat on that script at all. And so if a writer has written a line, it is up to the actor to interpret and figure out why. It's like a treasure map, right? You go through it and you might go, oh, this doesn't seem right, right? And in the same way, like, what well, you know, when you read it back, your scripts back, sometimes you'll go, oh, that line should come out. And then you realize if you take it out, it's like, Yang, you've, you've like messed up something that's coming later on, right? Yeah. And you couldn't remember at the time you go through it. But, but as an actor, you go through and, and, and you look at those lines, you, you try and figure out what, what the writer is saying. And I think a lot of the time that's because, you know, we grow up learning Shakespeare and do more plays that have been established. So, you know, it's not like you're reinterpreting or, or you, you're interpreting something new. So it's something that is established. So it's your job to figure it out because guess what? The, Hamlet's been done, you know, how many thousands of times before? Mm. But a lot of the times you find over here, and, and yeah, it doesn't mean there's no scope for improv, right? But I always say improvisation for the most part is like an escape hatch, right? It's like when someone messes up their lines and you've got to improv out of it to get back to the original line that should be there. I mean, that's what you do. That's why you learn it, it for stage, right? And I feel, you know that line in Tropic Thunder where it goes, I don't need script, script reads me. Yeah. So, <laughs> I've, I've, dude, I've been there with that. <laughs> like, well, I can't respond to that, dude, because I don't know where you're going. I mean, you know, you can play with it for a little bit, but then what happens is all that shit has to be put together in the editing room and the editor's like drinking half a bottle of vodka because he can't, he can't make head and the tail of it and he's trying to patch it together and they know yeah. they've got to go back and spend money on reshoots. So, yeah, I mean, look, I think phase four has been horrible. I haven't really wanted to see any of it. I like Black Panther. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was what everyone else, I think I'm, I'm on the same page as you. I thought, you know, I think Chadwick is a terrific actor. It's a huge loss. But then again, if you're going to respect his, you know, and, and you're going to talk about his legacy, he asked for it to be recast. So yeah. do that. And, and, yeah. and by the way, that also gives, you know, you respect your fans, which it just seems that nobody gives a shit about the fans anymore. Like, it's like, you know, I don't care. 
it's like an abusive relationship, right? Like, yeah, you might want that, but I, you know, I'm not going to give you that. In fact, I'm going to give you something that you hate, right? Um, but I, I do think that, um, but I didn't want to see the Eternals. I didn't want to go and see Wakanda Forever. You know, it didn't have now. And I love Black Panther. I'm a comic. I love comic books. So I was a Marvel guy. I really wanted to see Black Panther. Right. So part of me, I know it might be pathetic as a fan. I'm kind of like, thank God they can actually make a movie about this character that I loved growing up, you know, mm. and then, you know, you kind of come back to it later because look, I'm an actor, but I'm also a fan. Right. Like I like going to the films to, to, to see movies, but you know, on the other side, it is really difficult for me, as you know, because when you start analyzing them, it, it, re- it takes it away. Right. So you want to go and see a really, really good film. So you're not like taken out by the fact you go, oh, shit, like, what did they do there? And that's, you know, th- there's something technically wrong or, you know, the character you go, hang on a minute. That wasn't the character that was like, I, it, 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 it. and a lot of people might just glaze over that, like not really going, I don't know why I feel bad about that or I don't know why I don't get that. But we do because, you know, it is a it's a system. Mm-hmm. right that that you play within that system or that framework that you do your creativity within that and i think that that's frustrating um and I, look i want marvel to be a success i, I loved um iron man you know um i love robert and what he did and um you know a lot of the other movies and there are also movies that i can take my kids to so you know i can't like none of the movies I've done, I'm like they're like, Dad, can we see Black Hawk? Down? No, no, you can't <laughs> see Black Hawk. Down. Can we? Can we see so, Rambo? Uh, you probably can we see Rambo. <laughs> probably not. Uh, so you know. Anyway, I mean that's just my little rant. It's it's what has happened in Hollywood is the creatives are gone, right? The the real creatives are gone, and now you've got accountants running the studios and and accountants like they're not really looking to people that really understand um the process it's weird like you've got a bunch of people that don't really know how to make films making films and and then they wonder why they're not making the money back yeah it's a, it's a really different i mean the, the scripts are just just horrendous right now just but but hopefully what that's going to do is it's going to spawn um more independent filmmaking um like what you're doing and and that fills me with hope you know i mean hopefully like i have always worked on the premise that uh if you don't give the customer what they want they'll just go elsewhere for it and they'll find what they want elsewhere and someone mm-hmm. will provide it sooner or later whether it's foreign cinema whether it's more and more independent starting up um one way or another it'll happen and yeah you just hope that uh Hollywood, they eventually learn their lesson. Like I'd like to think, as cynical as this is, that they're driven by money. They want to make money, and so when they stop making money, they'll they'll eventually figure out what they're doing wrong, and they'll they'll start to adjust. I hope. Yeah. Because well, well, here's the thing though. That the problem is, is that the decisions are made like by very few people that all go to the same parties. Hmm. That's that's part of the problem. And trust me, they all go to the same parties. It's, it's like this little group. I mean, I I went in for to meet for um, Ali McBeal once. Remember Ali McBeal? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had to, I met with uh, David E. Kelly on that, and uh, the showrunner and a couple of more producers. And like literally two days later, I was at a party. I think it was at like a pre-Oscar party that I was invited to, and like. You know, everyone was there and the showrunner was there. And I think it was the showrunner or the producer, one of those guys and he were there and they told me, hey, listen, I know you came in for that role, and but but uh, it's not going any any further forward with you and don't take it personally because the show's ending. And I was like, <laughs> so, I, but, but I knew because I was in that party, you know, and I was there and it's like anything, right? I, on any kind of like high level, you know, if you meet someone and get on with them, you know that they have a value because a lot of it is to do with the money, right? The money value. So, so you have, you know, just, just to back it up a little bit, if if people don't understand this, right? So you get your movie greenlit by the actors that you put in it, right? So, so certain actors have certain value. 
So if you have actors that don't want to do military movies, or you have like a really big director that doesn't want to do that and they want to do this, then the movies that that actor wants to get made, he'll make, right? So there's more of a chance of those getting greenlit by the studio. I mean, I'm, obviously, you know all this. I'm just, you know, maybe telling it for someone who, who is not aware of it. So in a few times, there's, uh, you know, there'll be a studio that will say, let's make this film. But then they still want to go through and get their box office. That's why you don't, you, you know, you still keep seeing these same films over and over again. So it's really difficult to try and break that monopoly um, unless you have a small movie that makes, you know, uh, a kajillion dollars and then mm. the actor becomes a star and then all of a sudden people are asking him you know what he wants to do but i think that overall so when so when i came into the industry like black hawk down i think was made for like 80 million maybe 90 million dollars and when i did uh anacondas uh which actually was a movie i didn't really want to do i was actually lined up for two other movies and my agent said, you know, go do this movie because the one before I'd like Ice Cube and, you know, Jennifer Lopez and all this. And, oh, yeah. and horror, uh, oddly was enough, John Voight was in that as well, wasn't he? John I think. was in it. Yeah. Yes, he was. It, dude, it was an all-star cast. I couldn't stand the first movie, right? Yeah. Like, I wanted to do all these serious films. And then they go, hey, Matt, listen, we're going to pay you a ton of money and it's in Fiji and you go on Thursday. And I'm like, go do the movie <laughs> you know, because it's just because you know oh i'm gonna do my real credible movies you know afterwards but that was 25 million dollars right and that was considered to be a medium kind of a medium budget film if you get a a, a movie for 25 million dollars now that's a big budget film like in in hollywood because it's either the mega budgets it's like the 200 million dollar infinity war or you've got this step down, which is like this $25 million, um, you know, and then the independence like 5 million and down. But, but part of the problem is that um, the independent space, which is where, because obviously I've produced like three movies now, right? So I'm familiar with this, um, is that when you step outside of the studio system, you realize that the people that were outside of the studio system making movies before are like the worst people you ever want to meet, right? Because right. They're, 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 I'm sure you're going through that. Ah, give me your money. I'll show you. Yeah, where am I? I know where am I? About. I'll get so and so. I know I, I, ICM and CIA, and they're all liars, right? They all lie, and and what they'll do a lot of the time is they'll get you to commit your dough. And they don't have that person. And then they kind of panic to go and get the actor or, you know, try and get another actor to fill that spot. So, so what has happened is the money that will fund independent films outside of the studios, they've been burnt. They're like, yeah, I'll put money into this and, you know, I'll put $3 million into this. And then, you know, I, the guy ran off to Bora Bora with, you know, my maid. Uh, yeah. and, and, and honestly, it's like that. And, and so when you go... I don't think I've been to a place to raise funds where they haven't said, oh yeah, my friend or I, or somebody I know has been ripped off by the movie industry. So it's going to take a little bit of time before they realize that there are like you know, real filmmakers that understand what they're doing that will bring, because most investors think, oh, well, I'll just do movies and I'm never going to make any money from it, but you know, I'll, I'll be able to talk to the people down the country club that, you know, uh, I met Jennifer Lopez. Um, but now there really is um, a move to do independent movies because it's called show business. And actually, if you do it right, if you just put all those pieces in, in play, and you try to say, like you say, get rid of these egos because a lot of people have egos, obviously, in show business. And you just say, okay, look, this is how much the movie's getting made for. These are the actors I need. This is the story. Let's go and make it. Don't let it go over budget. Don't let actors stay in their trailer, right? Which is, you know, I've been in that position. Uh, and when I made I Am That Man, I was like, listen, I'm the only person that I know that will turn up on time every day for work. So I'm just going to have to play that role. Even though I didn't want to do that role, I'm like, well, I can, uh, I'm not, you know, that actor isn't going to stay in his trailer and, you know, he's going to do it for not a lot of money. Um, 
you know, because then on independent productions, you have an actor that's, you know, 15, 20 minutes late and then you, that hurts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It really does. It starts hurting. So. I mean, I suppose it's like any, um, any industry that gets so well established that everything just becomes entrenched and so you get people that have just been there forever um and they're just used to making money they're used to having it easy relatively um and when you get people like that that are calling the shots for all of these artistic endeavors you're not going to get great products because ultimately they just care about like doing it in the quickest and easiest way possible so they can make a, a quick buck and then move on um and yeah like that independent cinema should fill that space where you've got more like challenging stuff more interesting stuff more more ambitious stuff doesn't necessarily have the budget but it's got like a lot of um you know people working on it who really care about it because they just want to tell a story they're not doing it because marvel have hired them to do this movie that they don't give a fuck about but it's like well they're getting paid a lot of money to do it and it'll be a good on their resume you know that's that's the kind of people you want making films. It's just, it's hard for them to break into it now, I guess. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, the one odd thing in LA I have to say about, about Los Angeles is that you can get good people that will come and do it and they'll, they just want to work, you know, they just want to do and create something. And, it, and if they see that it's going to be something that has integrity or is interesting because they get bored with this shit, you know, I mean, people just do, it's like green screen, you know, I've got a camera here, I've got to do that. It's like plug and play, right? They, they want to do something that's a little bit more edgy. And uh, and there's still the capacity for that. But, I mean, look, what I would say to anyone that wants to get into the film industry is absolutely don't go to film school. Like, go and get a job on set, right? And, and, uh, and do your studying because a lot of the stuff now isn't what it used to be. You know, it's not, you know, I would say, like, they'd be better off watching your channel and watching what you say truly uh, because I have not seen anything that you've said that hasn't been absolutely accurate. You know, whether it be from putting a story together to character arcs to, you know, why modern movies suck. I, I send that link to so many people. You have no idea. Because it's, <laughs> no, dude, it's, it's perfect. And, and, and what you don't want to do now, like, is the youngsters to go to film school and they're learning the complete opposite of that. You yeah. know, they're not learning what you're saying there. And it's, it's, you know, it's really sad because learning the craft has taken second place to push in the message or, or, or to, you know, um, obeying the masters, you know. And when really what you should be doing is really focusing on, you know, the, the hero's journey and, and, and writing those kind of characters. And look, uh, everyone wants to make great films. They do. Uh, and then, like you said, some people get to a point where they're like, okay, I've made like five or six great films and now I'm just going to take the money because, you know, look at all the, 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 their heart is out of it because there's no passion, because there's no passion in the writing. And trying to get the, you know, get the two people together, the two groups together is really difficult because, you know, agents are the, are the blocks to that. Because if you want to go and talk to a, an actor, uh, you've got to go through the agent. And even though the, the actor might love what you have, you'll never get to him because the agent is going to take 10% of what you have to offer, right? Which is not what they're going to get from Marvel, right? So you never even hear about it. I mean, and, and that's a sad thing, right? Because... I think someone like, I'll tell you who isn't like that at all is Keanu Reeves. Like he's yeah. really someone, he's a, he's the real deal. He's also a super nice person, but, um, but you know, there, there are a few actors that, and I know they get very, very frustrated with their representation. Cause you're like, can you fucking give me the script? Like, I want to read this, like, stop being a filter. Yeah. Because, because, you know, a lot of actors, they don't need to work again. So it's like, just give me the money. Sorry, just give me the, don't give me the money. I've got the money. Just give me the good scripts. And that's yep. why, you know, like I said, I think that people should go and get experience on set and work their way up and see the way that it, that it works, you know, on these sets. Because, you know, a creative person is a creative person. You can learn online now how to write a script. You know, um, Ken Nolan said to me, um, 
every you know just know that your first draft is going to be shit and yeah. everyone's first draft is going to be shit he told me two things he goes your first draft is going to be shit and get past 50 pages you know those are the two rules of screenwriting from ken nolan he wrote black Hawk down and he's yeah. right you know you know that if you don't get to 50 pages dude that script is never getting written right you're like you're gonna go you're gonna stop yeah. so whenever i write i always make sure i get past 50 pages as soon as i can or like you know in a I don't let I don't leave a long period of time between the sessions, but mm. but um, you know I I think that people want to see good material, and they're fed up with the garbage. And and the funny thing is, is there's no argument to the videos that you've put out. There's none. I mean, what what are they going to say? I mean, with when I make them as well, like I don't do it from a position of um, just wanting to hate on things, but it's like yeah. I, per I I perceive a problem there, and I'm trying to offer like an explanation for why it's happening, and it almost saying to Hollywood, "Can you just stop? Like, I want you to do well. I want you to make good movies. I'd, I'd like nothing better than to be able to go to the cinema, see some great stuff, love it, and and sing its praises. But I'm not going to do it if it's if it's garbage, you know, and." Um, Dude, we're all fans, right? I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. We want to go and watch these movies. Like I take, well, I sat there and watched Thor Ragnarok. Uh, I mean, Thor Love and Thunder. I wanted it to be great. I knew it wasn't gonna, gonna be because too many people had told me that it wasn't very good. But I think that, that that comes through in what you do. It's coming from a real passion for what you do. You know, it's, it's different if you like going, oh, I think that, so and so and so and so is this and that but when you are deconstructing why why something is wrong right and it's wrong on so many different levels you look and you say how could how can you have not have such low esteem in your work or or you you have no pride in what you're doing yet there's there's i say all the time there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that would love to have that position that would yeah. work diligently to get it right. And you're just being lazy, right? You're just being lazy and just, you know, it, there's also this kind of, and it's only a recent phenomenon, I think, like you say, like, you know, serve this up so you can sell Hulk hands. Serve this up so you can sell lunch boxes. And that's not what the, you know, movies are the greatest art form on the planet. They are because they, they combine everything. They combine your visuals, sound, storytelling, acting, right? Music, all these things combined and it shouldn't be trivialized. And I think that, you know, people like you also, you know, loving the, um, the source material, right? What's wrong with that? Like you, th that is paying respect to the authors. You know, like your Tolkien's, like you know, all these. To me, that that's nothing but a good thing. And the frustration is looking at someone that is doing something that is destroying that. Right? That they're, they're destroying a legacy. And I mean, I went to a, a, not a comic con, but I met up with uh, Jay and and all, all the boys. You know, and and Steph at a you know drunk three PO and and Ryan. Yeah. And, yeah, I met up with them and it was amazing to go and see the people like dressed up in all the different different uh, characters and to see how upset they were that these these things that these these characters they'd spent such a long time invested in were just like just ripped up and thrown away like you didn't care like they that they didn't care. So, you know, that righteous indignation, I think, is absolutely justified. I, I think, it yeah, is. because it's like, on the one hand, if you just tell an original story and it turns out to be kind of shit, it's like, well, fine, okay, I don't care that much. You just did your thing and it wasn't very good, whatever. But like, if you're just if you're given say access to like some beloved legacy character or an entire universe, like with the, the say the Lord of the Rings, it's like this is your playground now, um, and you're being turned loose in it, and you completely fuck it up. Or even worse, if you're someone like Ryan Johnson, who intentionally goes out to like you know ruin legacy characters, like he was given Luke Skywalker to work with and turned him into a, an asshole and just like a a hermit who just wants to die, 
um, that's when people like myself are going to have a real problem because it's like you have taken other people's work that, that, that they created with like real passion and real, um, you know, artistic integrity and absolutely screwed it over for your well, it's own funny. ego. You know, it's funny that I always look at, you know, when you have tattoos, when people have tattoos done, other tattoo artists will not go over and work on that other person's tattoo, right? They won't do it. They'll say, I'm not doing that because that's someone else's work. Now they'll, they'll continue on on the rest of the arm, but they won't go over that work. And I, I, and I, I like the idea of that because, you know, look, if you're doing Tolkien, of course, you know, Peter Jackson took liberties with that, but it was all within the vein of, you know, nobody complained about it. He, he did a lot of research. He, he asked the right people the right questions. And I think that it's not too much to ask to just stay in that in that world right and respect the fans for example doing black hawk down one of the things that i get all the time from the military and you kind of said it as well was when people say uh, the attention to detail matters like you know having your your um i say costume because that's what it is as an actor but you know having your your uniform correct you know holding the rifle in the right way moving in the correct way all those things are little things that will piss off you know people because you're playing a real person in that in that world right but those characters for tolkien or you know the marvel characters or or in, in star wars we grew up with them like we're so familiar with them that when they start doing something other than what you know them to be it's very jarring and it's you start like going back and dismantling the other films as well in your mind and that's a really that's a really sad thing um and I, like i said i don't think that it is a um it's a negative thing so look like i said i i love the fact that you can write strong female roles we all love those i, I love silence of the lambs that you know i think great great character it's not saying that you can't write these these roles but like in the last terminator for example i'm like this sarah connor like sucks you they, know yeah I mean? they went off the rails with that, <laughs> that but, but you, know, you know what i'm saying and you sit there yeah. and all you do is it's, it's almost like ruined that memory of it as opposed to um you know rocky who even through the creed rocky still the character like it doesn't really i mean maybe the last one was different but but he still maintained that character so it wasn't like a big jump. He became someone else. I mean, the, the last one was, you know, slightly different. But, um, but you know, just, it, and there's also this kind of um, pride that you know at that moment when the screenwriter came and he was like, I know that this was an established character. I know that people love these, but fuck them all. I'm God. Yeah. I'm write something new because I'm so smart. And you know it, you know it in your head, that's what they're thinking. They're like, oh, oh yeah. I don't care. I don't care about this. I'm going to change. Oh, I think we lost you there for a second. Uh, I don't know if Matt's internet connections timed out for a moment. Um, I'll see if he comes back <laughs> just uh, while I'm waiting for, for Matt's connection to come back in. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, I lost you there for a moment. Yeah. Yeah, my bad. Um, right. What I was saying now, ranting about something. Someone is saying um, like the overlords have struck him down. <laughs> like you were, <laughs> you were spitting too much truth. Yeah, no, I mean, but look, it, all of this comes from number one, loving the art, right? Like loving the medium, loving what we do. Um, and, and secondly, you know, you want movies to be a success because you want more of them, right? You want it to go on because ultimately if the movies aren't a success, I mean, which might be a good thing in the long run, as you said, what happens is the companies fail. And then when the companies fail, then they can't make movies anymore, um, which might be a good thing in some instances mm. at this point, anyway, or at least like make them like change their, um, their trajectory. But it, it all comes from a place of loving it, you know, and, and wanting to do good work. Like I said, I love, strong female characters I've, I've played opposite you know 
certainly one of them. Uh, one very, I know, I know you're not a fan of those films, but... Uh, I but, wanted uh, to ask you about this a little bit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, you know, I mean, like I said, I just want it to be written very well. And, and, you know, so I'm not like, oh my gosh, like, why are you trying to say this? Like, it's okay to be vulnerable, but it's okay to be strong as well. It's okay to say that that person can be... Like, like Mulan is a classic example, right? I know you, you talked about Mulan in one of your videos, but that, that is a, you know, a classic example of why become like this super overpowered person instead of overcoming something. Like I'd much rather see someone that can overcome something than just come in like, you know, like a, 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 some kind of a elite warrior from the very beginning because there's nowhere to go. And that's, yeah. that's really sad. I mean, it's crap filmmaking as well, actually. Yeah, it's just it's it's lazy and it it kind of like gives you a really crap message to your audience as well. You know, it's like, um, well, the Mulan was a good example of, you know, instead of teaching them like, look, you can you can overcome adversity through hard work, determination, perseverance, like life's going to throw you a lot of curveballs and like hit you with some really hard knocks. But it's your ability to get up and, and keep yourself going that uh, that really makes the difference. Uh, to the new one where it's just like teaching people you're just amazing the way you are and the rest of the world just needs to learn to deal with that and I think yeah. god what a terrible lesson to teach young people like they're going to take that go out into the world and just get their asses kicked you know it, well, the it, problem it, like, is the problem is is the people that wrote it were told that and guess yeah. what they got they got a job at the company without really having to work their ass off or anything like that I'm not I'm not saying in particular that that person but someone making those decisions you know, it might even be the executive that says, I want it like this. And the writer goes off and does it. But at the end of the day, it's because those are the people that are out there and they know inside that they didn't work for it. They know. And that's, that's part of my theory on why actors sometimes are so extreme with their politics is because really they're like, I didn't really, I'm not, I don't really deserve to be here. I'm making shit tons of money and I'm flying all over the world and I feel really bad about it. So I'll just say a lot of stuff, you know, oh, by the way, I'm just going to Bora Bora and my G5. But you know what? Climate change. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> I worked for every fucking thing that I've earned. Every yeah. single thing. I, 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 every single thing I worked for. I've earned every dime. I come from nothing, single parent, you know, working class council estate. I have no shame at all, like no shame about that. And so that's why I stand up to people. I'm like, listen, I bought a truck. I bought a truck because I wanted a truck, you know, and you're not going to shame me into not driving my fucking truck, right? Because I love my truck and I always wanted one. Oh, yeah, because you know it's, it, it's not like this size and it's not powered by like electricity. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, by the way. I've also lived in California and I've also been there when they've said, please don't keep your air conditioning on because the power grid can't take it. So I'm like, you can go and have your trucks if you want, but you know, your electric vehicles if you want, but you're not going to, going to be able to power them. Power them. It's, dude, dude, it's all hypocrisy. I hate hypocrites. And that's one of the reasons why I started to open my gob on Twitter because I'm like, I know what you guys are like on set. Don't give me this bullshit. Like, yeah. just, just don't do it. It's, it's, it's patronizing. Everyone sees it. And I don't want to be associated with that because that's not what I am. That's not who I am. I didn't, I didn't you know, I, the, the things that I believe in, I'm very proud of. Uh, and I came to a conclusion on them through going through a process in my life of learning and failing and trying to figure out shit, right? That's, that's life. And I, I might be wrong with some of those things. And if I am, I'll go, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But, you know, I, I, I certainly, I'm, my main thing is, dude, is not pontificating about things that I don't know anything about, right? Like, I'll, I'll fairly say, hey, listen, I can talk about film industry, I know it. I can talk about freedom because I like having it. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it's like, and, and other things, um, because that affected my life. And, and if it affects my life, I have a right to speak about it. And, I, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I watch some things like Ruffalo. I'm like, shut your oh, mouth. Oh, that will man. You? Like, God. shut up. <laughs> shut up. Like, everything he comes out with is just. And, and by the way, listen, I totally believe it was my. Like, I am a meat puppet. I say other people's words for a living and I pretend, right? 
I don't think that I'm some kind of great political sage that should be listened to. I don't. Um, but when you get to a point where everybody else is saying shit and there's no other side, there's no one else coming back and going, hang on a second, don't, you know, because I'm in this industry, I'm sick to death of people going, oh, oh, Hollywood. I'm like, hang on a minute, hang on. We're not all the same. We're not this like, you know, big generic yeah. block of people. So that's why I started opening my mouth. I, I really didn't want to. I'd rather have just shut up and got on with my job. You know, I think it, for, look, for the most part, I think it ruins, ruins people's enjoyment of watching films when you're like, oh my God, Rob Reiner, shut up, mm. right? Like, you know, you just keep, you, you say things about people. I've had this, I've been in the room and, and by the way, look, the majority of actors, when you start coming up, you're, you're on the left, at least like a little bit on the left from, from center. You know, and then, you know, you start having to pay tax and you start moving towards the right, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you start, you know, reading about the world and you have kids and, and things change you, you know, and, and that's just a natural process in life or you, or you, or you don't, and you just become kind of really indoctrinated, but I'm, you know, I never saw myself as someone that would come out and speak about these things and. But I think that certainly, again, talking about the the message in movies, it's because it's just ruining it for I, I, I wouldn't want any other. I just want to experience. I want to go to a film and I want to be entertained. And I don't want something shoehorned in there. If something isn't, like you said about Top Gun, like having a diverse cast absolutely worked in that situation. There was no... There's not one moment where I was like, hang on a second, loved all the characters. Um, it was a, it was great. But when you start coming in and fucking with the system, like, you know, the, j just uh, storytelling because, oh, I've got to get this in here. And you know what? It sticks out to, a, I mean, you know, it especially because you're a screenwriter. You're mm -hmm. like, how the hell would I get that in to my screenplay without messing it up completely right like it, 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 you can't do that you have to compromise something unless it's about that particular topic you know what i mean if you yeah. if you're writing something like milk then okay it's going to be about that that's fine just go well yeah it. like that's that's the point of the movie but it's like uh yeah if you're watching something like star wars it's escapism you know, it's like I don't yeah. want like current day political events like really awkwardly shoehorned into this movie, and I don't want to be told like I'm a horrible person just because of, sort of like how I was born or where I was born or something like that. It's it's such shit things to tell your audience, you know. Um, yeah, but it's, it keeps it's just, happening. Well, well, it's horrible things to tell other human beings, and and we don't want that for anybody. And it appears that when you defend it from your side, then you're called all kinds of names. Right. Yeah. But, but that's not what it's about. Like, like I said, you can have those movies. I think it was, uh, um, I can't remember what the guy's name is. Now. Uh, Tyler Fisher, I think his name is he did this whole thing about like why this latest, you know, message movie failed. And he said, Oh, because all these other movies have failed before when actually they haven't, they've, he was doing it as a joke, right? Like they've always, they've been a massive successes in the past because it was a more organic thing. And now people are coming to this going, I'm just sick of you shoveling this at me. Like mm. if you do a movie here, like you can't come out and say, if you don't come watch this movie, you're racist. Or if you don't like, you know, Wakanda forever, then it's because it's got black people in it. That's absurd. I mean, that's just, it's a ridiculous thing to say. Well, this, this is the, the marketing tactic now, because when they, they had the Woman King that came out like a month or two ago, Viola Davis literally was getting interviewed saying like, well, if you don't see this, then you're, you're just um, prejudiced against black leading ladies. And it's like, what a terrible thing to say to your audience. Like, you literally have to come and see my film because I've told you so, because I'm going to brand you like a, a racist or whatever if you don't. Um, that, that's not how you get people to see a film. You should be like, yeah, come and see it because it's really good and we're really proud of what we've done here. Um, and, you know, I think it stands on its own merits. Like, you can't berate people into watching your movie. That's awful. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, you know that there was one actress that was on it that 
read the script and she was like, hang on a second. When she started researching it, it was like these people enslaved people and put them on a beach and put them in cages. I don't want to be a part of that, right? Now it's like the Mitchell and Webb sketch, isn't it? It's like Hans, are we the baddies? <laughs> it's that, but it's true. And so she's like, I don't want to. Have a, I don't want to be a part of that. And so what I think that again, now we're saying, look, there are thousands and thousands of amazing stories. Like there are so many amazing stories. Don't be so damn lazy. Go and get one that really is an in- incredible story. That again, but, but this is the same thing, right? They took a story and they're like, it's kind of like, uh, I'm not going to look at that. Uh, okay, so we're really strong. We're, oh, let's just forget that bit. Oh, we're really strong, you know, legitimate warriors and blah, blah. Oh, let's forget about that little bit over there. You can't yeah. do that. It's, it's, it's insulting. And then, I mean, I don't see her saying that to the actress that walked off because she said, I can't be a part of this. So, you know, uh, like I said, th- this weird demonization with people that say, you know, if you say that you don't like this or that you you can see this, look, I'll give a classic example, right? Braveheart. Yes. I mean, Braveheart, there were, there were there's aspects of that, right, that were not accurate, right, like the kilts. But the truth of the matter is, is it's, just, it's a great film, right? It's a great film. And everybody loved it. They, everybody went to watch it, right? Everyone mm-hmm. went to watch it. And they were like, okay, there was no, I mean, you know, there was, you know, a lot of people, some people were like complaining here and there, but, but you know, you, there is art. What I'm saying is you have to take artistic license in films else. It, it just doesn't, it's just not, you can't make movies, you know, you, it's like Black Hawk Down. We took artistic license in that film. You know, uh, and sometimes you have to, like, there were seals on the ground in Black Hawk Down. Well, we didn't get the approval from the Navy to say that there were seals on the ground. The Navy said there were no seals, right? There were, there were other aspects of that film that we had to slightly alter. And that is artistic license that can, you know, streamline the movie, right? Like Peter Jackson did it right in Lord of the Rings. He kind of, like, moved a couple of things around. But you don't, like, just do this to whole things that are central to the the actual story and then say i'm gonna i'm gonna fixate on this and i think that's why those other movies like braveheart and uh, which you know I, I don't know how you feel about that being a scotsman i mean i, I thought it was a great film i think um, i thought it was a great um <clears throat> it was a great you know piece of storytelling um yeah like you're like you i, I recognize like it's not historically accurate but then it's uh it's a hollywood movie and so yeah. i you know, if I wanted historical accuracy for a story like that, I would go and watch a documentary about it. You exactly. know, that's kind of a, uh, you know, it, it's its own thing, really. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, but, but this is the thing, is what, what they're trying to do now, because people have to remember. I'll tell you what Stallone said to me once, dude, it was so funny. We're going down the river on that boat, right? Yeah. And uh, he goes, okay, like, you know, roll in. And he turns around and he, he says to me, remember, this is forever. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. But I'm like, I'm like, no pressure. No pressure. Because, you know, I mean, look, you're doing a movie with Stallone. It's Rambo. You know, I'm, I am human. I, of course, I'm going to be like, don't fuck up, right? Like, don't make a mistake. But the truth of the matter is, is these movies that are getting made are going to be there forever, right? So we forget that people are going to come back and watch them and say, oh, is that the way it was? Like, is that the truth of what it was, right? Because people are going to be lazy and they're not going to go and look up the historical aspect of it. So, you know, it, like you said, if I want to know about something, I'll go and watch a documentary. I'll go and watch a movie to be entertained. If it's in around, you know, uh, as long as it's in the ballpark for me and it doesn't take too many, like, massive liberties, that's okay. I mean, you got to tell a story, right? Yeah. Um, there was just there was one or two things I wanted to ask you because I know there was quite a, su- a few like questions that are come in on super chats that would be great if we could maybe um, put to you just for you to answer. Yeah. But um, yeah, there was f- the first up we, we touched upon it briefly earlier was that you were in one of the Resident Evil movies. I think it was Resident Evil Extinction. Um, yeah. You know that I, I you know I got my own opinions about those movies, but uh, I tell you, man, with each new Resident Evil project that comes along, they look better and better. Like. 
when they did that Welcome to Raccoon City thing, I was like, oh, that's fucking crap. And then the, the Netflix TV show came along, and I was like, holy shit, that's a whole different, you know, definition of shittiness. Yeah. But I can look at the Mila Jovovich movies and say, like, they were they were just fun action flicks. Like, they, they didn't they didn't take the, the source material all that seriously. They were just about, like, you know, how can we morph this into some just, like, fun, you know, zombie-killing action? And they just got yeah. kind of more and more over the top as time went on. Um, but, like, what was your... I guess what was your experience like of working on that? Like, how did you find it? And what do you think about those movies in general? Um, so, uh, I mean, I know Paul and Mila very well, actually. Um, but... Um, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm just still here. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. right, I was kind of reaching okay. over for the door because the critical like, dog was trying to get in, so <laughs> I just didn't okay, want to see okay. me stretching halfway okay. across the room. <laughs> so, so when I did um, when I did Extinction, I was actually finishing. I was finishing another movie that actually didn't turn out too well, but but at the time it was looking really good. Uh, called DOA, Dead or Alive, which is based on another video game franchise. So I, I finished that. Um, and then I went on and I did, um, Resident Evil in Mexico city. And again, it was one of those things like, so Russell Mulcahy was directing it and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Like, I'm a huge Highlander fan. So, you know, you do movies for different reasons, right? Like I really wanted to work with, um, with Russell. Um, and you know, again, it was a, it's a big movie. So, you know, you have to look at things in the context of, you know, the openings of these films and what it means in Hollywood for your career, right? So you do a movie like that, that makes, you know, a lot of money, then you're, you know, you maintain your value in the marketplace. Um, and also, you know, I know the Resident Evil fans are hardcore fans. Um, so I was just, you know, I looked at that role, it's a cool role. I get to die in a different way again, you know, cause I was like, how many different ways can I get killed? Um, and so, yeah, I got my eyes poked out. Um, so I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go to Mexico City and I'll do a movie with uh, Russell Mulcahy and and be a part of a franchise. You know, I was I kept making jokes. I'm like, I'm in Anaconda Two, Resident Evil Three, Rambo Four. I'm going with the sequel. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's it was it was nice to be a part. Look, I'm always grateful for work. You know, I'm always great. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I know I'm very fortunate to be in a career that not many people succeed at. And, you know, although, I mean, you know, for the first 10 years I turned down and I still do, I turn down stuff all the time. People think if you're not working, it's because, you know, you can't get the work. It's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you don't want to do. Um, and that includes like very big movies that you don't want to do but it includes small movies that you don't want to do as well. And for all different reasons. But so I went down and I did the pickups on DOA in Mexico city and filmed, um, resident evil while I was down there. So that it, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was mm. a lot of fun. I've got, to see um, the, 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 I've got to see the pyramids in Mexico. It's great. Yeah. You get to work with yeah. Mila Jovovich as well. You know, it's got uh, its advantages. I did. I mean, she's she's awesome, actually. I, I I know Paul and Mila. I keep telling Paul like, I think that Re um, the Event Horizon is his best movie. I think it's yeah <laughs> an amazing film. Like I did. I said I said at some point because look, th there is an element to that as well. It's like the tall poppy syndrome. You know, Paul is actually one of those directors that number one is a is one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. He really is a great guy, and you know he's he shoots action brilliantly. He's a brilliant, brilliant action director. Um, and you know, when I get a, when I got a chance to work with him, I did, you know, I was actually meant to work with him on, uh, on alien versus predator, believe it or not. There's a whole story about that. that I'll tell okay. you offline. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he's a, he's one of the good guys. I always said to him, I said, there's going to come a point where people are really, because he got criticized initially a lot for the movies he did. Um, and again, you know, there are opportunities that come along and don't come along and there are ideals that you have and, you know, that's just the nature of the business. Um, but I said that one day people come back and they'll appreciate you for what you have done. And I think Empire did a big article on him 
uh, I think Event Horizon is one of the scariest movies I've ever seen in my life. Um, so, you know, it, uh, Paul, Paul could, you know, he's still got time to, to really do something really, really special. And he's got it in the locker, you know, if, if he decides to do it. Yeah. I, I imagine with the, the Resident Evil series, you know, they were, they were dependable money-making movies. Yeah. You know, they were a good star vehicle for Mila. Um, the, the, I, I think the problem that they had is like they almost treated every movie as the last one. And so yeah. they would have a fairly conclusive ending or whatever, or have no idea what they were going to do with the next one. And so the next movie would come along and it's like, we have to undo half the things that happened in the previous movie. And like you would get an intro that just undoes half of the, the previous events and then sets up a whole new storyline that they, they, they try and continue forwards. Um, and it was just a, an example, I guess, of writing yourself into a corner. But yeah. it's a shame because, you know, especially with the first couple, there was definitely like a, a kind of energy to them. Like they were really trying to do something that was somewhat faithful to the, the video games. And like, I'm a massive fan of those, those old Resident Evil games anyway. Um, so I was excited to see the films and it was just, you know, they, they started deviating more and more as time went on and just, it, yeah, I mean, it became a uh, bit crazy. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, the, the nature of the industry, you know, a lot of the times is because don't forget the decisions that go into this. Now, I'm not saying that this is the case with, with these particular, with this particular franchise, I don't know, but you know, you make a movie, it's a massive success and you say, that's it. I'm done. Right. And then like 12 months goes by and the studio looks and they go, we could really do with another movie that makes a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> what did you know? And, and then it just comes back again. And I think with those, with, with the other franchises, because I think, you know, Resident Evil was made by Constantine and Screen Gems. And so I think that, that that was a well that they just kept going back to. Yeah. And people just enjoyed going to them, and um, and and you know, Paul gets to work with his wife, which is great. You know, they get to go and do that. So he writes and directs it. I mean, with the one that I did, he didn't direct, although you know, he had a lot to do with the film. Um, so you know, I mean, I, I just think again, like I said, you you have an idea of the way that your career is going to go, or about that you know you're going to do this film, and then it's going to lead to this, 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 and this. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot, in, like I said, there's a lot in Hollywood, like if you don't, you're only as good as your last film. So you will drop off like very fast. And so a lot, and it's a lot to do with agents, like being on you, like, Hey, listen, you know, your last movie didn't work. So you need to go back and you've got to do this, or, you know, you need to slot back into something like, look at, and, and there's a lot of instances where you can see it work. Like, as you said, Stallone hadn't had a hit for a long time. It comes back, he does Rocky and Rambo. He's bankable again yeah. and he goes and makes expendables. So I yes. mean, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's also a business. I mean, it, you know, especially as we've moved along through time, it's not like the seventies anymore where, you know, someone would really go to bat for you to make a great film and they wouldn't give a shit. Um, you know, they're like, I don't care, you know, about, you know, what happened on his last movie. He's a great filmmaker or he's a great actor and I don't care. Same thing with Travolta, right? Like nothing, 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 Pulp Fiction. Mm. He gets everything. So, you know, there is an element of that, I think, in all these things. Uh, and it's, it's you know, from someone on the outside looking in almost, you'd be like, why are you doing that? And then when you get in the in the game that's going on, um, then you go, oh, okay, okay, I see why that, that happened. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, it, it really does. Um, it's, I can totally get that, that process of, you've kind of always got to stay on top and getting judged by your last film and like you just always live with that feeling i suppose that it could all go away if you have a couple of flops in a row because yeah it's it's brutal um but yeah the, the 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 other thing i just wanted to ask you about um before we answered a few questions was um you obviously had a recurring role in reacher which i think is a really nice positive way to to finish up on because that i think was a show that brought back that kind of strong male archetype you know reacher is a character that's uh he's, he's physically enormous obviously um and they got a good actor to play him you know they didn't try and force someone like tom cruise into the role who i love but he's he's not reacher for sure um yeah. 
and they they were pretty pretty faithful to the source material and you know you got to play his dad in the flashbacks and yeah yeah it must it must have felt good to be part of something that's been so well received and just so like antithetical to so much of the garbage that we get now yeah well i mean yeah i, you know, I think reach is a great franchise and uh, and you know i don't think it's uh, any coincidence that it both reacher and um and top gun maverick were made by skydance mm-hmm. right so you know they know where it's at they're they're on top of stuff they're a great studio because that's what they are really i mean they're a studio um and so you know when when the reacher thing came along um i was really excited to play it because you know in the books they said that uh jack reacher is actually his father makes him look like liberace uh, so, so I, I was speaking to someone at Skydance the other day about about doing things, and I said, you know what would be really great? I said if Stan Reacher had his own spin-off. Yeah. Um, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was great to be a part of it. I was I was happy to be a part of it, and um, and the kids were great. You know, the the kids that played my sons were uh, were awesome. You know. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and it was received very well. Again, you never know. Like I said, and, and when a role like that comes along, you go, okay, I'm going to go take it because I like the character, I like the the franchise, and it's you know it's always great to be um, to do stuff with with big studios again. So yeah, I was happy to do that. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously while we've been chatting here, and I don't want to presume too much upon your time because you've given up quite a bit already to this, but. If you have a little bit of time, there's questions that have sure. come in while we've been chatting. So um, I'll maybe read out a few of the super chats and see if we can get through them. Um, okay. So the first one was Kung Fu Hot Dog, who says, uh, Hey, Matt, as a brown man, I've never complained about not seeing my race in certain films. I grew up in the 70s and 80s and love my exposure to pop culture. Um, so, yeah, I think he's just making a point there about, um, yeah. you know, I like, mean, Look, look, I grew up, I grew up, um, I'm a, for my sins, I'm a West Bromwich Albion fan. And, you know, I grew up with what they call the three degrees, Brendan Bratson, Laurie Cunningham and Cyril Regis. And Cyril Regis was an idol of mine. I didn't care that he was black. He didn't bother me. And I think that there's a lot of, I, look, I understand that there needed to be a little bit of adjustment, you know, where there needed to be more representation. Um, but one of my biggest gripes is write great stuff for people of color that's all you've got to do just write great stuff and then you're not setting them up for comparison with other people and you're not setting them up for failure right or you're not like bastardizing um a, a legacy character you know just write new stuff and nobody would have a problem with that that there's not a problem and this is the problem that that we get a lot of criticism that that you know fans are complaining about these characters being race swapped it's not the the fact that they don't want these, you know, people of color in these roles, right? It's not against people. It's just don't destroy the character because that's not who the character is. That's it. Mm-hmm. And, and you can go off and write something else and do something else and make something fantastic, and nobody has a problem with that. And and so it's it's a real lazy way of getting off making a bad shitty decision or trying to make a woke like decision um by blaming race blame it on race that's bullshit it's it, yeah. it's not right and the racism of the people that are watching it you know we you know, I, you know look is there a better character than apollo creed i mean what a great character mm. he was i mean that there's there's tons of inspiring characters in in um in film of all colors yeah. no i agree um the next one is from Farewell Thunderchild, who says, uh, Matt, you did Corey and Emmerdale. Did you try for EastEnders to get the domestic treble? I uh, oh. could <laughs> see you being a long lost <laughs> member of the Slaters. Yeah, is that like um, is that like doing the treble, like the FA Cup, uh, the league? And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that would be funny. You, you know what? I mean, no, I never tried. I didn't even intend. I actually thought that I wasn't going to get relationship because I did uh, Emmerdale. Um, but you know, I have to say after all these years, and I've been in America now for 20 years, I, I would love actually to do something on Kari or, or on East Ends. I'd love to go back for a little time because on, on Kari, I feel like, you know, the character could go back and do a little bit more. 
again, it's not about the, it's about the characters and doing something within the character, mm-hmm. you know, and the character arc. So, uh, or extenders, that'd be kind of cool. I don't know if anyone else has done that as Denise, Denise Welsh might have done that, done three different subs, but yeah. It'd be, it'd be uh, quite a cool thing to do. Yeah. It's like I've done the, the big three. Um, yeah. It'd be fun. It'd be fun to do extenders. I think. Uh, the next one's from Chuxenhausen, who said, Matt, I love following your Twitter account. You destroy those libs harder than Hawk from Cobra Kai. You're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I just, I'm not into, I'm not into the, into the demonization of other people just because they have an opinion. And the majority of the times the opinions are shot down as being racist or as being, you know, homophobic or this and that. And none of those things are true. They, you know, there's just just slurs out there to make you be quiet and for those of us that know that we're not racist and we're not homophobic see uh, i mean i married a maltese woman right and i have a bunch of kids and and my oldest kid which a lot of people don't know is is uh biracial as they say i don't say that but um you know and people don't know that you know so i'm like you can say whatever you want i know who i am fuck you for trying to smear me like that. I'm not going to bend for it. So I think that a lot of people have been frustrated as well because they've been smeared as that just because they have a differing opinion. And two two things. Number one, it's really tragic because there are real racists out there and there are real people that are bad, that deserve homophobes and whatever. But when, when people you don't like or you disagree with are being called that, it just it just destroys the the effectiveness of the word, right? It's like, oh, you're a Nazi. I'm like, I'll get a history book and read what that is, dude, then get back to me, right? Because this is just disgusting. It's just disgusting. So, and like I said, I'm a meat puppet. I, I, I pretend to be someone for a living, but I just felt like there was a lot of people that didn't have a voice. And I, so I just opened my big trap. And uh, yeah, thank you for that on Twitter. Uh, tell your friends. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll never work again, but uh, but no, you know, it is a lot of people are like, thank you for saying that because they're fed up with it. So, yeah. Um, Angry Batman says, Hail Drinker and Mr. Marsden just finished Deception Game. That's one of my books. Uh, mind blown once again. Can't wait for the next one. Excellent guest from Great Films. Thank you very much. Um, Next one is Curtis D of Montana says, uh, Hail Drinker and Mr. Marsden, name three people, living or dead, that you'd like to get drunk with. Uh, would have loved to try and drink with the legend Andre the Giant. Do you think you could have kept up with him? <laughs> <laughs> he drank some like 60 beers in one night. It's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> Goodness, mate. Go on, so t- who would yours be then? Uh, if off the top of my head, I'd love to go drinking with Winston Churchill because he fucking oh. loved his booze. Um, I I would love to do um, oh Christ Stallone I think I would I'd love to talk to him I I think just because of the the incredible movies that he's been in the career that he's had I'd love to go drinking with him um, and as for the last one um, it would yeah it might be Sigourney Weaver um, huh. just for having done the the Aliens movies. Man, I'd love to talk to her about it. <laughs> I think that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Stallone has amazing stories. Like, just the most. And I, I'd sit there and ask him all. Because we're on this stupid boat for hours and hours. I'd ask him all kinds of stories. But I think for mine, I, I, I was actually thinking Winston Churchill would be cool. Uh, Oliver Reed would be kind of awesome. You yeah. You go drinking with him. He liked his uh, booze. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, by the way, there's a great video of a guy that I don't know if you've seen it. He drinks the same amount as Winston Churchill did in the day, and he does it. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> I, I've heard of this. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a journalist. <laughs> He's like hammered by ten o'clock. And um, I'd like, I think Capra. I'd like to go right. drinking with. I think mm. Capra would be a really uh, amazing person to go drinking with. So. No, that's that's pretty fucking good choices there. Like. Um, the next one is uh, Eric Parker, who says, Matt, uh, did you and Alan Richson get up to any off-screen antics while filming? I met him at a convention, and he seems like a really fun guy to hang out with. You know what? We 
I only met him over Zoom because we shot, they shot in Canada and we shot our stuff in Los Angeles, but he was super nice on, uh, on, um, on the Zoom meeting that we had. And, um, you know, he seems like a really cool guy, but, you know, we just, we shot separately. Right. It's funny because uh, someone had a gotcha with me the other day about the COVID. The, no, oh, didn't say. It. I didn't say it. COVID. The unspecified virus uh, of unknown origin. Origin, uh, and they were like, "Oh well, you know, didn't everyone have to get it to go over to Canada?" I'm like, "I didn't shoot in Canada, do shot in LA." But uh, keep going with your uh, your gotchas. But yeah. Um, next one is Araf, who says, uh, "Have either of you guys been following the World Cup?" I haven't, weirdly, because it feels just wrong that it's on at the winter time. Like, I'm so used to seeing World Cup games, like, in, in pub gardens, like, beer gardens outside in the summertime. And when it's on in the winter, I just can't get my head wrapped around it. I just feel like I've never tuned into it, really. Yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, look, it's certainly different for me being over here. I mean, even in, when I was in LA, because I'm in Texas now, when I was in LA like you'd still feel like it was a world cup i mean it was the summer so everyone would go down the pub there's a lot of english pubs we go to over there in la coaching horses and a couple of others um but i watched it just before this but um uh yeah i mean it's it hasn't had the same atmosphere for me and and all the other shit that goes on with it i just want to watch a game of football and cheer when the team yeah. is. i don't know totally. the other shit that goes with it my apologies but, uh, no, yeah. I get you. Uh, next one is uh, Stuart Hamilton, who says, "Hail the critical drinker." Thank you. Um, Tyrion Razor says, "Do you pl do you ever plan to review the boys season three? I will. It's just trying trying to find the time, man. Honestly, it's it's been tough. It really has. Uh, it's one of those ones like the longer it goes on, the more pissed off I am that I haven't done it. But it's just yeah, you're trying to fit things in. Um, Diano says, "Hail critical drinker and Matthew. Great interview. Thank you." Um, and no one of consequence says, in regards to men being portrayed as stupid and ignorant, remember those progressive soup commercials. In every one of them, the woman infantilizes or talks down to her male counterpart. Um, I don't remember them myself. I don't know if that was an American thing or something. But um, yeah, I'm not surprised, to be fair. It was just it was just a thing. Uh, it still is. Like The husband is generally portrayed as an idiot in most of these things. Um Rebel Scum says, I want Matt in your movie. Believe that. <laughs> it's Ryan Drake right here. There you go. <laughs> um, next one is Steve Frischman says, I can't wait for Indiana Jones 5 with super action actress slash babe Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <laughs> Sounds great. Maybe make her the lead for Wonder Woman 3. <laughs> God. Oh, that movie, man. What did you think of the trailer? You've probably seen the trailer for it. Yeah, I did. I did. I mean, listen, again, it's one of those things where I'm like, just leave it at, um, at the Holy Grail, right? Like, just leave it yeah. at the third one. I don't consider the next one. Even though, look, I mean, you know, I've worked with Shia, um, and he's actually a really nice person. He's a really lovely guy. And but so I felt bad when I saw that film. Oh, my headphones are going to run out of steam in a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, that's all right. Um, but, um, I thought they covered up a lot of stuff, but again, it's like, you know, how old is Harrison Ford? I mean, it's kind of like playing on, playing on your, you, you being, you know, romanticizing about the, the way it used to be. So I don't know, man. I mean, I, I've, I've learned now, like not to really get my hopes up on anything. So, you know, I've got a kid crying in the background there. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I, obviously, I know that uh, you know you've been on for about two hours now. Um, yeah. If you if you need to finish up there, like no, I'm, I'm, good, I'm good for a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'm actually believe it or not, I'm going to the Dallas Cowboys game in uh, in a little while. So uh, so yeah, I'll be going off to that. Okay. It's not uh, fun, but but no, think, I'm good uh, for a little bit. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll probably be able to get through the the super chats then and finish up. Um, All right. Yeah. Right on. Uh, it's Curtis D of Montana says, um, drinker, before I had my neck spinal cord surgery, I went on a bucket list. Uh, my friend got me Lagavulin from the distillery edition. So good. Thank you for telling me about Lagavulin whiskey. Uh, surgery went well. Well, I'm glad to hear that, man. And um, yeah, hope you're on the mess soon. Is that your thing? Lagavulin is my whiskey. Yeah. Uh, Dude, Lef I'm a Lefroy man. 
Ah, uh, see, it's the it's the smell <laughs> that puts me off Lefroy. It's the everything that puts people off Lefroy. I feel like Le Gobelin, is that how you say it? Or Le Gobelin? I've been in America too too long. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Lagavulin. Is, is Lagavulin. Yeah. Eh, Lagavulin. But uh, I, I yeah. feel like it's, it's more of a refined, like, Lefroy, because it's smoky and peaty, right? But um, yeah. Yeah, I love this. I remember the first time I had a Lefroy, someone was walking, I was in a bar in DC, and someone walked past me. I was like, mmm, smell of peaty log. I'd like some of that, yeah. please. I love it. But, it's you know. got uh I, it's it's some smell that it's got but uh, it's yeah. weird it tastes better than it smells i think but it's just that put me off a little bit it smells um, like antiseptic as well it's, it's yes got a weird like yeah someone said but it smells like tcp and ever since i heard that i can't get out of my <laughs> it head does, <laughs> it does smell now. like tcp it does it's true um tibby van heel says a drink for me to the drinker thank you very much um george the giant slayer says one, studios need to step back from trying to impress their red carpet friends and feed the obsession of identity-consumed, clout-addicted critics in the Hollywood hive who prostitute themselves for shoulder rubs from celebrities. And two, get back to the basics. Strong story and real characters in surroundings and situations outside of the everyday norm. Sopranos, Yellowstone, Time Bandit, Star Wars, Something Fresh, All Hail Drinker and Matthew Marsden. Thank you very much. And yeah, awesome. you're, you're right on, man. Exactly yeah. right. Um, Curtis D of Montana says, Drinker, my profile picture I'm using on here is my neck image post-surgery. Uh, I'm glad that I'm still here watching you and everyone in chat. And yeah, man, I, I hope the surgery went really well and I hope you're on the mend soon. Uh, Gunstar1 says, The drinker speaks the truth. That's it, pal. Have a wee dram of Highland Park 18 that was bottled in the 90s. Steaming drunk now. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Highland Park's a good whiskey. Um, I don't know if you've had much of that yourself, but that's another one of my no. favourites. It's, uh, it's real good stuff. Uh, let me just refresh this for a second. Uh, from Q, who says, Matt, work with the Daily Wire. They're making some great stuff now. Yeah, well, I know, I've known Jeremy for a while. Um, you know, there's a few of us, by the way. Yeah, and yeah, there are people um, out there that are scared to say stuff. Um, I don't know why, because, you know, they're all high net worth individuals. But, you know, again, I, I consider freedom to be more important than money because they'll always take your money if you don't have any freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, the Daily Wire, I don't know how they're doing right now as far as what the productions, you know, what, what state their production slate is in. Uh, but they know where I am and who I am if they want to give me a call. And like I said, I know, I know Jeremy. Um, I don't know Dallas, but, um, you know, I know Jeremy and I've met Ben. So, you know. Yep. Um, next one is uh, Flavius Alicanthor says, This is a brilliant session, Mr. Drinker, and a joy listening to Matt tonight. It gives me hope that behind all of these woke loons, there are still some really decent people in there. Uh, vodka tonic tonight, sir. Cheers. <laughs> nice. Uh, but yeah, like, well, the, the the quote that you use often on social media is like, not all actors are like this, I promise. And it's it's really worth keeping in mind. You know, there's a lot of people working in the industry who are just normal, level-headed people who just want to make movies and tell stories. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, if you're a carpenter, you don't get up in the morning and think, you know what, you know, well, I'm carving this, you know, or making this. You know, having it, I'm going to carve some shit in it about what I believe. You just go and do the work. And I, you know, I think, I also think that there's a difference because in the UK, like, from my experience anyway, I, I wouldn't know what my mom would vote, which way she would vote. No idea which way my grandparents voted. Um, and I just think it's more like, well, if that person is doing the right thing for me, I think I'll vote for him. And if that person isn't doing the right thing for me, I don't think I'll vote for them. And it's a little bit more like, you know, we're not entrenched. I know some people are like, you, you know, like when the mining was going on and all that, that was very much like you'd be Labour. I guess, you know, where I come from was Labour for a long time up until the last election. Um, but I, I think that there was there was less of a you know less of a difference you know it's like a little bit more fine lines so you could you could vote conservative and everyone go okay you vote conservative this time yeah but 
They didn't do very well that election, so you know they didn't look after me. So I'm going to vote Labour, and it's not so much of a stigma over here. It's it's like it's your religion, mm. like you know if you're a Republican, that's the way you think. You think this, 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 and this, and there's no like, there's no subtlety to you know. I, I always find it funny that you can go to a Starbucks and you can order a vanilla latte with a triple shot, uh, you know, soy milk, you know, with a I don't know with a frigging umbrella in it if you want but over here when it comes to political you're like you're conservative oh that means you're this 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 and if you're you know a, a liberal you are this 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 and this and it's just not true it's it's a it is a weird thing about the state you know there's no nuance there's no subtlety yeah it's just like a binary thing like you're one or the other basically and there's nothing in between yeah, well, yeah, it's like you, like you said, if you don't like what kind of forever, then you're a racist, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not an either or thing. You know, you can criticize a movie and just because, you know, it's about Wakanda, it doesn't mean that you're saying that it's, you know, you, you hate African people. You know, it's it's a real ridiculous thing. And, and it's, what is it, the bigotry of low expectations as well. I was, right? I was like, about to, yeah, I was about to mention that. It's like, well, I would hold these films to the same standard that I, I would hold any film, where it's like I expect a level of quality in terms of the storytelling, the acting, the, the production and stuff. And to say like, well, no, I'm going to go easy on this one because it was made by like a certain demographic of people, that's really patronizing and shitty to do. Uh, well, that's I the definition it's... of it, right? I mean, that is the definition of it, is like saying, oh, hang on a minute, because you're a different colour to me, then I'm going to go easy on you because I don't think that you're as good as. Yeah, you know, and it's, I, it's I'm not, the, yeah. I'm not going to, like, like I hate affirmative action. It, for, for those people over in the UK, I don't know if they, they have it over there, but affirmative action is like, they're lowering the standards for, <laughs> I just think it's just the most racist thing ever. I'm like, why? Why are you lowering the standards so that, you know, people of color can get in. That's ridiculous. You know, I don't, you know, because it's not about, the, you know, whether you're intelligent or not, whether you're good at something or not, your, your skin color has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's bullshit. You know, if you think that it does, then, I mean, I understand like a limit, a limitation of opportunities, um, but that's just as much economic as it is race. You know, it's economical, you know, it's not, um, and by the way, you know, for me, growing up with single parent in a working class council state, I don't begrudge people that are middle class or upper class. And, you know, we all have our own challenges, right? We all have our own issues that we have to overcome. And, and I think it's very naive to, to just think that there is this one thing, right, that, that will hold you back. And I think, again, it, it goes back to what we were saying before about, about um, you know, having characters that just don't have to overcome anything. You know, mm -hmm. we have to overcome everything every fucking day, right? Anyone that goes, you know, is north of 40 understands what they have to overcome to get out of bed with it, you know, aches, aches and pains or, you know, you have kids and you have to navigate what it's like to be a father or a parent and, you know, things are changing all the time. So even, even though you can go back to your parents and ask them for advice on how they dealt with stuff with you, dealing with a modern society with smartphones and the internet, the, the internet, we're making this shit up as we go along. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it, it's just the way it is. So things are changing all the time. And I, so I, I just think that this, all this identity politics and it's the worst thing to happen to us because it, it, it takes away each person's individual humanity and who they are. And I think that it's reflected in the way that these, the writing is in movies, right? I really do. I think it's a problem. And they're also like, you know, poo hoo in the older people. Cause what the fuck do they know? When, mm. well, what we used to do is we'd look up to the older people in every society in history, apart from the past two generations, we've looked up to elders in society and said, you are wise, tell me. What can I learn from your past experience? Because I want to become more wise. Now we've got young kids saying, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. It doesn't mean your experience doesn't count for anything. You know, the movies that, and this is exactly what goes on in the storyline of these films, right? Yep. Nothing that came before can be superior to what I'm doing. So fuck you. All your storylines can be gone. You were wrong about the character and let me rewrite the character in a better way. Because what do you know about today's society? And the fact of the matter is, is you know, the, the characters 
you know, although the the environmental things that are impacting on those characters are different, the challenges are the same, right? Like the 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 emotional and, and ethical pull between right and wrong is 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 eternal. I mean, it's it's you know, it's 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 one of the great things that you have to deal with in the same way as overcoming certain things. Now, you know, before it might have been overcoming, um, I'm driving a cattle train across America and I've got to get over those hills. Now it's like, you know, I'm locked in my room 24 hours a day. I'm losing my mind because I'm not free, right? How do I overcome that? There's always something to overcome. And because they haven't in their career for the most part because you know they went to the right college and or they knew the right person they got in they've never had to overcome anything they can't understand the fact that someone else would have to overcome any, anything because if you have a hero that is has to overcome something then you can't see yourself in them yeah and it, it's such an interesting paradox to create because then they're writing characters that no one likes because they don't struggle with anything. They don't have to overcome anything. Um, and yeah, this is this is always coming from these writers who are like f from Southern California. Uh, they they've gone to like some like fancy like arts college to get their their writing education, and then just gone straight into these like high profile roles where they're writing for for TV shows and movies like worth tens of millions of dollars. And it's like, <laughs> what what position are you in to lecture anyone about like not just characters but struggle, hardship, like adversity, uh, taking on the challenges of life? It's like you're people that have never really done anything. You've never risked anything, and you've never suffered anything. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. it's the worst kinds of people to be trying to lecture us. Um, but yeah, um, Charles Hurst was saying, uh, Hi gents, great to see you, Matthew. I've really enjoyed your work, especially in Rambo. Uh, question for you. Have either of you guys seen the Korean film The Swordsman? If not, then I recommend it. Cheers. Haven't seen it. We'll watch it. There we go. Uh, Mr. H says, Hi Matt, i watching at work in the black country right now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm all right, Aki Joe. I'm all right, Boston. <laughs> and people think that the Scots have a thick brogue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Knuckle Hunky Box says, "If you want a good story, sorry. If I want a good story, I watch a movie. If I want accuracy, I will watch a documentary. And if I want propaganda, I'll watch a Michael Moore documentary." <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, Mister Wise Guy says, "Anaconda Two was lots of fun. Uh, you had that end coming." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, Pete says, question for Matt, What's, what does he think about Quentin Tarantino as a director? I think, so my favourite movie right now of all time is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think right. it's unbelievable. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, he's got his finger on the pulse of what is happening and he doesn't like it at all. So, you know, I, I, I do... I wasn't a fan of Jackie Brown, actually, but I love Pulp Fiction. I love Reservoir Dogs. And, you know, I mean, I think he's a, he's a really great director. Um, again, you know, the, the stuff with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. It's funny because I was watching that, you know, the part where he goes into the, the Airstream trailer and he loses his shit. I'm like, that is <laughs> yeah. so accurate. That is so <laughs> accurate. I'm like, man, that was unbelievable. But again, it's like, a man growing up and becoming a real man, you know, understanding that he can't be a baby anymore. And so I, uh, yeah, I think he's, he's great. Um, the next one, I think this is kind of covering something that we talked about earlier in this stream, uh, from Matthew Aronson. He says, question from Matt, have you read the book Black Hawk Down? And if not, you should also have met, uh, sorry, you should also, um, have you met any of the real guys for the event? So you kind of mentioned that earlier that you'd read. Yeah. It. Yeah. So, so there was one guy there, well, the two guys there when we were doing the film, they are actually tech advisors on it. Um, we, I met one of the guys before, so I met Kenny Thomas before we deployed out from Fort Benning. And then Lee Van Arsdale, who was a Delta guy, was there on set. And uh, John Collette was there as a ranger. And then since then, I've been speaking quite often to the guy who I played, um, uh, Dale Sizemore. He actually bought me a, a bottle of whiskey that's it's called Three Rangers, and it's in my uh, in my bar here. 
But I am an Alton, so I'm going to drink with him. And then um, I met Norm Hooten, who Hoot is based on. And uh, I actually went shooting with him, which was, uh, yeah, you realize that you're just an actor and you're not on the level of these guys. <laughs> They're amazing. Um, and uh, I've got, he's, he's got um, a line called Hooten Young. And I've got right here in my cabinet, right to the right, I've got um, two boxes of cigars he gave me, which have uh, Operation Goth Gothic Serpentine. And he has a Hoot & Young bottle of whiskey, which I still have not because I'm going to drink with him when I see him. So next year is the, um, is the anniversary. And I, they're having a, a, a gathering here in Dallas. So I'm very privileged to have been invited um, to go with them to that anniversary. Um, so yeah, I, I, I know a few of those guys. Yeah. That's awesome that you've, you know, you've gotten to know them and, you know, kept in touch with them all this time. Yeah. It's, uh, it, you know, it speaks highly really of like that, that bond, I guess. Uh, well, they're great men and, and, you know, people forget like this was pre nine 11. I mean, even the movie was, you know, we shot the movie pre nine 11. So, you know, there hadn't really been any, um, like the conflict that Americans remember, Panama, where I have Grenada and, and Black Hawk Down were the, were the three real big ones. And, um, and, and like Black Hawk Down was really etched in the minds of Americans with, you know, soldiers being dragged through the streets. So, you know, I mean, I, I took, and I still do take my responsibility as an actor that was in that film very seriously because we portrayed real people. And, uh, and that means something. Yeah. Um, Bomber 44 says, Matt, can you believe it's been 20 years since Anaconda's hunt for the blood orchid? It's been three years and I'm still 28. <laughs> Next <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Adam West <laughs> says, Matt, that's all we want and need in entertainment. A good story, good actors and confident directors. Have a drink on me, Matt and the drinker. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, that's all we want from entertainment. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Aronson says, Hey, Drinker, have you thought of reviewing SAS Rogue Heroes? Yes, I have. Um, yeah, I was just out drinking with a couple of my mates last night, and uh, one of them was raving about it, said it's really good, and um, yeah, I just need to get around to watching it. Um, but yeah, it sounds good. Uh, Cracklin says, Will Hollywood stop the trend of putting misandrists in lead roles anytime soon? Um, doesn't seem like it so far, but <laughs> we hope. Um, the problem is they put them in the writing room. Uh, <laughs> that's the, the real thing. It's true. Uh, uh, Caputs Lupinum Pictures says, John Oliver had this bit about Hollywood whitewashing and they were talking about The Last Samurai saying, really Tom Cruise is The Last Samurai, but he didn't know it was about him fighting with The Last of the Samurai. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, well, you said John Oliver and I, I immediately checked out. You know, you can also say Stephen Colbert, and I'll check out on that one as well. And Jimmy Kimmel, and I'll check out on that one as well. So. I wouldn't blame you. Um, Sophie says, I'm a Latina, and my favorite characters have been male and not Latinos. Uh, I care about their character development. Question, what character would you like to play, if you had your choice of anything? Oh, is that to me? Yeah. Yeah. James Bond. There you go. Yeah. There's still time. Uh, I'm getting old, him. mate. Uh, I'd be like, oh, L7's <laughs> just gone out. Uh, Roger Moore did it till he was about 800 years old. So. He, did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. No, I would. And there's there's also um, there's also a great um, character that uh, that a friend of mine wrote, Kurt Schlichter, called Kelly Turnbull, and it's a really great character. So hopefully we'll be able to bring that to the um, to the screen soon. That'll be awesome. But I, I think every British actor would want to play James Bond. Pretty much. I'm not even an actor. I'd like to play him. But I mean, oh, it's yeah. just one of those things, you know. But not the new, not the new one. Not, I don't want to not... play the new one. I want to play the old one. Yeah. Uh, the, the Sean Connery type of yeah. Bond would be fine. Um, Jake says, I'm a no-name writer. Any suggestions for a starter with no contacts in the industry? Um, yeah, it's it's tough when you're just starting out, like get yourself yeah. an agent, try and find one. You've just got to go through the process. You know, it's like trying to apply for a job. You put your letter in, you put your sample of your work in, 
hopefully someone will take you on and they'll represent you and then you go from there but yeah it's a hard industry to break into now um james evans says great to see a, a walsall lad succeed respect to you that'll be for you yeah uh elusive kudos says have you ever watched uh, rise of the guardians it's a 2012 animated film by dreamworks and it features the voice acting of hugh jackman chris pine isla fisher and so on i highly recommend it um i haven't seen that no um rennie a says great interview drinker love matt's transparency nice uh and rennie's one of my mods so she does great work um and there's only two left and i think that's it so lord Love kamina that. says watch uh dora hidoro it's like post-apocalypse harry potter mixed with pulp fiction where everything is designed by the uh, band slipknot <laughs> that sounds fucking wild man mm. uh, and cody griffin says my lady made me pay to ask what if josh hart sorry what is josh hartnett like my question is though as a combat vet myself did being in Black Hawk Down change your perspective on soldiers or in life? So it's like a two-parter question for you, I guess. Okay, so, all right, Josh, lovely guy. Lovely guy. I mean, when, when I, when we worked together, um, he was just coming to terms with being a really big star. Uh, you know, I think that it was probably a little bit too much for him and he didn't like that. No, he was, he was genuinely just wanting to be an actor um and you know he'd done pearl harbor and then he's black hawk down and then you know he was a uh, it's hard to think now because he went away for a while but he just you know he he just wanted to be an actor but he's a he was a very sweet guy um so that's the first thing second thing um thank you for your service first as a combat veteran i've been very fortunate to be in the lives and and be included and be around a lot of combat veterans over the past 20 years um yeah black rock down changed my life forever um i was uh i've told this story a couple of times but I, I'll, I'll tell it again i was we, we were at um you know there's a live fire site um you know in, in the sas court the killing house um but there's one in fort benning and basically you do close quarter combat any rangers or anyone that's been through benning will know about this and and they have a gantry that's along the top. So the instructors walk around the top and they watch the guys going through cleaning the room, clearing the rooms. And we will learn how to do that. And uh, I was sitting outside and I was doing my actor thing. And I turned around to this guy and I was like, uh, hey, um, why did you join? Because, you know, in the UK, pretty much you, you join because you want to have a trade, right? Or, you know, you like fighting and you want to go and fight professionally or whatever, you know, it's not like, I, I have never met anyone in the army that said I wanted to join for queen and country. I've, I've never met that in, in the UK. I just haven't. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I said to the guy, why did you join? And this kid was, he was a ranger, maybe 21 years old. And he said, I joined for freedom. And it, you know, as you know, that's a really, like, you never hear that. Like, I've never heard anyone yeah. say, I'm going to go and give my life for freedom. And it was just like someone hit me with a bat, right? And I thought, this kid is going to go and die for me. Right? He's going to go and die for my freedom. He doesn't care that I'm, you know, at that point, I'm an American now, but I'm British. And, you know, he, he didn't care. It was like, for your freedom. And I said, you'd die for me, wouldn't you? And he said, yes, sir. And I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. And so after then, you know, when we went over to Morocco, I spent a lot of time with the actual guys, you know, with the Rangers. And it just made me want to know more about America because I always knew that I loved America, but I didn't know why. You know, I'm going to watch the Dukes of Hazard. I love that. You know, I love Knight Rider. I loved all those, you know, the A-team. And But I'm like, why is it so different? You know, why is the, the, the USA so different? Why is it so prosperous? You know, why do they have all the cool shit? Like, why yeah. can't you buy a throwing knife uh, or a throwing <laughs> star? You yeah. know, when I was growing up, I'm like, why can't I have a throwing star in, in England? I want, I want a throwing star. And then I came over here and I studied, like, researching the, the, the founding fathers and, you know, the war that we never taught about, right? We never taught about the war of independence against England and why that happened. I, I certainly was. I've done a few words. No, we never got that in history. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> like, and you're like, holy shit, like, these guys were right and we were the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> right? Hang on a minute. And, um, 
and so that that really inspired me and then you know 9 11 happened and a bunch of the guys that we train with and those battalions were deployed and you know one guy in particular sergeant Breras, didn't come back you know he was killed and um you know it's a strange thing when someone that you know that is a real person and you know has a real life and they're not just a statistic when they go and they die yeah. um and and you know being you know my life will forever be you know joined with the ranger regiment because because of think about this like black hawk down came out in 2001 you know a lot of people joined the rangers because of black hawk down you know so we portrayed the heroism of the guys that went before and so a bunch of people went and a lot of people didn't come back mm -hmm. and so to me i felt like i had a responsibility to do what i could for the people that you know came back and they weren't in the same state as when they went so yeah. I've, you know i've worked a lot with veterans charities with the garrison east foundation um you know, it's it's the greatest time of my life actually to work with real heroes. You know, that's why I don't give a shit about the Hollywood thing. I'm like, you guys have no idea. You know, when you've had someone that's had their stomach blown out and they've crawled, you know, and it, it, the, the stories that I get, you know, I met a guy the other day who was one of five surviving quadriplegics. You know, he has nothing and and he fought back you just can't complain and you see the best of us in these guys and and so you know i'm gonna lose my fucking career because i'm gonna stand up for freedom for somebody else well that guy lost both arms and both legs so yeah you know what i'll be a complete wimp if i didn't do that i'll be and i'll be oddly detached if i wasn't moved by the experiences of these men and women um that gave so much um by the way if ever you guys get a chance read the story of uh joe kent a guy who's running for uh was running for um congress in washington and his story the story of his wife is unbelievable what his wife sacrificed she was an incredible individual but anyway so yes it changed my life um in a, in a really amazingly positive way and um you know, I think the more and more you see, you know, when I'm on set and I'm seeing that the freedoms that these people fight for just being, you know, diminished, it's it's really difficult when you see the sacrifices. And for example, when people, I know it's getting a little bit heavy for a minute, but when you see people come back from Afghanistan and they feel like with the withdrawal that just happened, the way it happened, that everything they did the people they lost, the limbs that they mm -hmm. lost, the the struggles that they have has been for nothing. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. So it's um, it's the least I can do as a as a as an actor is to just open my mouth. So, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I appreciate your honesty on that, man. It's um, you know, it's a great thing that you're involved in, like you know, giving a kind of a voice to these people and and doing what you can to help them out um and speaking up for them um, and cody griffin said the same thing here um yeah thank you very much for your response matthew i greatly appreciate it and drinker it's always great to see you brother love these interviews um yeah i think yeah i, I can't add to that really man um i guess Sorry, it's a bit heavy no i think yeah that's a pretty sobering way to to finish up really um and that's, that's coming from the critical drinker as well um but yeah man i i want to say Matt, thank you really for your time tonight. I know you've you've given up like two and a half hours, and it's it's been a long stream. But um, I think everyone here has really appreciated uh, everything that you've had to say. Like all the comments have been like super positive, and they're just like, yeah, this guy's absolutely fucking based. It's great to hear this from from an actor. Um, and yeah, like it's uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you on, man. So thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. Like I said, I mean, I love your work, and um, and I was very excited to do this, dude like very excited to do this so thank you for having me yeah i'm glad i'm glad we were able to make it happen finally um and <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you to all everyone right. that's come in for this and uh all the super chats thank you for your generosity as always um and yeah very much appreciate it but uh we'll finish up there so that's all we've got for today so go away now there you go